Yeah, so Ulum al-Qur'an may be defined as, and this is Muhammad Ali Sabuni, so this is in Tibyan fi Ulum al-Qur'an. Uh, studies concerned with the Book of Revelation sent down upon the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's another definition, I don't have it on the screen here, uh, th but this is by Mufti Muhammad Taqi Usmani, where he says, Ulum al-Qur'an, um, um, he describes Ulum al-Qur'an as studies concerning the words of God sent down upon the Messenger, written down in manuscripts, and transmitted to us continuously without any doubt. So, so what are these, um, what are these topics or areas of study? So here's just a few of them, right? So we have the Quran's concept and process of revelation called Ilm al Wahi. Then we have the collection of the Quran, Jam al Quran, the arrangement and order of the Quran, the composition of the Quran, the coherent structure or nazam of the Quran, the seven modes, the ahruf and canonical readings the Qira'at of the Qur'an, the study of the transmissional uh, chains of narration, the Asanid of the Qur'an, the manuscripts, the Masahif of the Qur'an, the occasions of revelation called Asbabun Nuzul, uh, the abrogative aspect of the Qur'an called Naskh, etc., etc., okay, among other things. Okay, so most Muslims have abandoned the study of traditional texts concerning these ulum, these disciplines, these areas or topics of knowledge, and have rather relied on certain amateur preachers and apologists to teach them about their scripture. And this has led to Muslims abandoning the Qur'an altogether. Okay, and in the Qur'an, the Prophet ﷺ is quoted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, وَقَالُوا رَسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا That the Prophet ﷺ is quoted as saying, O oh my Lord, indeed my people have abandoned this Qur'an. Right? So this is a perennial problem. So I mentioned preachers and apologists. Okay, so a preacher is called a wa'idh, right? And a wa'idh is not necessarily an alim, a scholar, right? So every alim, every scholar could be a preacher, potentially, but not every preacher is an alim, okay? In fact, there could be a huge difference between the two. Okay, so one of my colleagues is a tuna. He's a Catholic priest, and this man is just brilliant. I mean, he is a teacher of the trivium. He's fluent in multiple languages, just an incredible breadth and depth of knowledge. And he's a Christian, right? You turn on the TV and you'll listen to a televangelist. He's also a Christian. But there's a major difference between the two, right? One is an alim and one is a preacher. Right? Um, so there, there's nothing wrong with being a preacher who's not a scholar, as long as that preacher sort of stays in his lane, right? As long as he's in contact or has recourse to the ulama and doesn't present himself as a scholar, so he's not pretentious. But the problem is that most laity, right, the awam, the sort of general Muslim masses, they can't tell the difference between a wa'idh and an alim. Because the wa'idh, the preacher, looks and sounds the part, right? So even if the preacher says something wrong, the lay person will tend to run with it, right? Why not? The preacher, you know, had a beard, he had a kufi, Quran and hadith are falling out of his mouth, right? In fact, um, I don't know, maybe 99% of khutbah, uh, of, of khatibs on Friday, who deliver the Friday sermons across the West are not ulama, they're preachers. Again, this is okay, as long as the preachers are staying in their lane, right? Uh, and this is why, by the way, this is just me personally. You know, I, I almost never wear like a turban or even a kufi. I don't wear a jubba, you know, when I give lectures or khutbahs. This is my personal preference. Um, I don't want to give people the wrong impression. So I'm not an alim in the traditional sense. A traditional alim is someone who's studied sacred sciences for 25 to 30 years full time, right? So then why should you listen to me? Why are you here? <laughs> well, because I will present to you what the ulama have said, okay? Also, some of what I will present to you will be from the standpoint of um, an academic in, in the more sort of Western sense, which is useful as long as we ground ourselves in the foundations and frameworks of our traditional scholarship. I also use the word apologist. An apologist is like a da'i, Right? Basically, someone who calls to Allah and his messenger, which is obviously good. But again, there is the danger of conflating the da'i with the alim. 
right? It's like Ahmad Didat, rahimahullah. He was not an alim, right? He admitted this. This is not slandering him. Um, he was a da'i. He was an apologist. And the word apologist comes from the Greek apologia, which means a defense. So an apologist is someone who defends the deen, right? And we need apologists. I consider myself an apologist uh, and a preacher to some extent. Um, but an apologist, again, has to stay in his or her lane, as it were, right? Like I gave a talk one time, and I said something very flippant about another religion, like sort of disrespectful. Uh, and one of my teachers, who is an alim, he pulled me into a room and he censured me, right? He like really kind of checked me. Uh, and I said, okay, khalas, I'll be more careful, right? I didn't say, oh, yeah, Shaykh, you don't know what you're saying, and the Quran says this, and the Hadith says that, and, right? No, akrimul ulama, fa innahum warathatul anbiya, right? Uh, and if, you know, we make mistakes, we should try to correct ourselves. But the Hadith says, uh, honor the scholars, for they are the inheritors of the prophets, right? So we must tread lightly around the ulama. Now, one of the signs of the sa'a, and this is a major fitna, uh, is, is when the scholars become less and less accessible uh, or when the scholars become corrupt. And both of, these, both, of, both of these things are mentioned in the hadith. Right? These are signs of the sa'a, the qabdul uh, the ulama, like the seizing of the scholars and the prevalence of the ulama usu, like the evil scholars. And so the secret of this ummah is the sanad, the chain of transmission. Right? So if someone is claiming scholarship but has no sanad, then be careful. So anyway, this is a problem as I see it. Muslims have relied on amateur preachers and apologists to teach them about their scripture. And in fact, they were miseducated by these preachers and apologists who in their zeal to repudiate the Bible and draw a sharp distinction between the Bible and the Quran, they began to assert that the text of the Quran was uniformic in nature from its very inception. That, uh, that unlike the Bible that has numerous textual variants, we were told that the Quran has no textual variants. And this is, of course, not exactly true. Okay, this is an inaccurate sort of a reductionist, which is to say simplistic understanding of the Quran that I think has harmed our community. So basically, these preachers and apologists, they sacrificed academic rigor and nuance for the sake of this sort of interreligious one-upmanship, right? They wanted to score points against the Christians, basically. So what is accurate then? What do we learn from our traditional literature written by our traditional ulama? Well, we learn that the Quran has never been a uniformic text, but rather a multiformic text, okay? And it does have textual variants, but these are not of the same kind as those of the Bible. Okay, specifically the New Testament. There's a major difference. So let me explain this briefly just to show you the difference. Okay, I hope this isn't boring for people. As long as I'm not bored, that's all that matters. So. <laughs> Several of the textual variants of the New Testament. What is the New Testament? The Christian scriptures, right? The 27 books written in Greek. So several of the textual variants of the New Testament were deliberate changes, okay, made to the text by scribes many years after Isa okay, that were, uh, that were motivated by theological rivalries among early Christian groups. Okay, so they have theological significance and they were written well after the lives of the autograph authors. Autograph authors means the original authors. Okay, and the textual critics know that these, that these were later changes because they have access to earlier manuscripts and they can track these changes. Now, the vast majority of the differences in the New Testament manuscripts um, are accidental scribal errors okay, due to you know, misspellings. There's something called parablepsis. That's a nice term for you. Parablepsis means the eye will skip. So a scribe is copying something. He'll look at the page. He'll go back and then he's... For example, he's copying the word, um, uh, I don't know, uh, God, right? He sees the word God, like theos in Greek. So he'll write theos, and he'll go back to the page, and he'll see the word theos, but it's on a different line. So he'll just continue from there, and he'll skip a section. That's called parablepsis. Very, very common mistake. Uh, there's didography, didography, which means that basically you repeat, you accidentally repeat a line or a word. 
um, there's something called assimilation of parallel passages, which is where uh, a scribe is copying something and then uh, he, uh, a very common sort of line in a text and then he's thinking it's actually another text and then he sort of assimilates them, writes it down in that way. Um, However, some of the changes were deliberate and made it into authorized versions of the New Testament canon. So th this is just an example here. This is called the Johannin Coma, right? You see this up here, 1 John 5, 7. This is the only verse in the entire New Testament that explicitly, unambiguously teaches the doctrine of the Trinity, okay? This verse, so there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one, right? This verse is not to be found in the most ancient Greek manuscripts. Okay, so this verse uh, appeared in St. Jerome's Latin Vulgate in the fourth century, which was eventually declared authentic by the Council of Trent. This is one of the ecumenical councils that was held in the 16th century. Um, this verse entered the Greek manuscript tradition in 1522 with Erasmus. You'll also find it in popular English translations like the King James Version, which is also called the authorized version. It contains this Johannin coma. Uh, but when more ancient Greek manuscripts were discovered in the 19th and 20th centuries, they noticed that this verse was nowhere to be found. Uh, today, the major Greek critical editions uh, do not contain uh, this verse. So for centuries, Christians lived and died believing that the Trinity was explicitly taught by the New Testament. Uh, it is not. Okay, so by contrast then, the so-called textual variants of the Qur'an uh, that are authorized are firmly traceable to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam himself and are a facet of the very revelatory nature of the Qur'an. Okay? In other words, the authorized Qur'anic variants are part of the revelation given to the Prophet himself. And the evidence of that is the ancient and mass transmitted tradition of the seven ahruf, so we're going to talk about this, the seven ahruf. It's very, very important. But, but that is a big difference then, I think, between the Quran and the New Testament. Okay. Now, are there unauthorized variants of the Quran? Unauthorized. In other words, are there things, are there, are there versions of verses in the Quran that may not be recited in prayer, for example? There are. The answer is yes. Why are they unauthorized? Well, the answer is because the chains of their transmission um, could not be verified as being both widely recited and having their origin in the Prophet And we'll get into all of that, inshallah. And I'll give you specific examples. This is still the prologue, by the way. We haven't actually gone to these. Now, um, now this is where, let me just finish the prologue. This is where the enemies of Islam come into the picture. Okay, so you have these revisionists and polemicists. You see those terms at the bottom there? Revisionists and polemicists, and, and I'll just sit on these two, two terms for a minute. I'll define them shortly. So these are like agnostic, atheist, or Christian opponents of Islam. So they've taken notice of the average Muslim's ignorance of his own traditional literature and his claim of textual uniformity. So what these critics, they do, they, they dip into our traditional literature and they pull out these isolated narrations that debunk the claim of textual uniformity a claim that no real Muslim alim ever made, and then they deceptively present this to their audiences as evidence that the Qur'an is not preserved. So they'll say something like, in your own books, it says that there are three versions of uh, the sixth verse of Al-Fatiha. It says, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, with a sod. And then it says, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, with a seam. And then it says, Ihdina zirat al-mustaqim with a zap, right? So which one is correct? And then the Muslim who doesn't know any better says, oh, this can't be true. You must be reading some book authored by an Israeli agent. <laughs> Does that, that can't be true, right? But what the critics don't tell their audiences is that the traditional Muslim authorities have always believed that the Quran was revealed in a multiformic fashion and that this has nothing to do with the Qur'an's preservation. All traditional authorities maintain that the Qur'an was preserved in light of its multiformic nature. In other words, these critics, they weaponize our own literature against us. Right? 
They use our own traditional literature to tear down these straw men that ignorant Muslims constantly keep creating with their misguided claims of textual uniformity. And I'll explain what I mean when I say the Quran is multiformic. This is an extremely important thing to understand. What does it mean? Quranic multiformism. Very, very important. Okay, so who are these critics then? So these critics, let's start here. Who is doing this? It seems to me that it's really two groups. You have these radical historical revisionists. Okay, a radical historical revisionist. This is someone who swims against the tide of the historical consensus. Okay, like someone who says that, um, that Isa alayhi salam never existed, for example. There are people like this, right? And they have PhDs in history that are making this claim. Um, the second type is the hostile Christian polemicist. A polemicist is someone who uh, um, is very ag aggressively attacks another religion, right? It comes from the Greek polemikos, which means war, right? And these two groups are not necessarily mutually exclusive. In other words, many of the radical revisionists are atheists and they're agnostics. They hate religion in general. They're called anti-theists. But some of them are also Christian polemicists, okay? Okay, so but I want to begin by talking about the, what's known as the external evidence of the Qur'an in the first century of the Hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad Okay, the Hijrah, of course, is the migration of the Prophet and his followers from Mecca to Medina in 622. So to put it as a question, how well is the Qur'an attested in manuscripts, physical manuscripts that are dated to the first century Hijri? And again here, perhaps a comparison with the New Testament will help us put things in the perspective. Comparisons help us understand, okay? Um, so if, if you don't know anything about typing, and I said that I could type 15 words per minute, 15 words, you might say, well, that's good, I guess, right? I don't know. But then I said, well, the average is 40. And you say, okay, that's, you suck. That's, that's pretty terrible, okay? So comparisons help us put things into perspective, right? <laughs> So this is not an attack on Christianity or the Bible. This is, what I'm going to tell you is completely factual. Okay, so if people are offended, then facts are offensive. Um, but first of all, how, how does a textual scholar date a manuscript? How do you date a manuscript? So according to Dr. Haitham Sitli, who's probably the foremost scholar of Quranic manuscripts in the world, he's the executive director of ICSA, which is the International Quranic Studies Association. Last name Sitli, S-I-D-K-Y. So according to Sitli, textual scholars basically look at three things, three main things, okay? Um, so there's paleography, there's orthography, and radiocarbon dating. So paleography, okay, looks at letter shapes, how are words written. Orthography looks at spelling conventions, how are words spelled. And then radiocarbon dating is a type of scientific analysis that gives age estimates for carbon-based materials. So th these are the three main things. Okay, so paleography looks at what? How words are what? Huh? Written. Orthography looks at how words are spelled. And radiocarbon dating is scientific analysis that dates carbon-based materials. Now, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, was speaking and teaching the gospel in the late 20s and early 30s of the first century CE. So how much of the 27 book canon of the New Testament is attested in extant manuscripts that are dated to the first century? What does extant mean? It means we actually have them in our possession. Physical manuscripts in the first century. And keep in mind that traditional Christians believe that all of the books of the New Testament were written in the first century and that they were all authored by apostolic authorities, um, that is to say eyewitnesses to Jesus' life and message. And of course, many Christian apologists who are also anti-Muslim polemicists continue to hold to this view, the view that all of the New Testament was written in the first century by men who interacted with Isa alayhi salam, peace be upon him, in some way. So what percentage of extant New Testament manuscripts are dated to the first century? The answer is 0%, literally zero, okay? The absolute oldest extant manuscript of the New Testament is the size of a credit card. It's called John Ryland's Papyrus number 52. 
it contains a few verses of John chapter 18. It's dated to like 125 to 150. Okay. So let me say it like this. Out of the nearly 8,000 verses in the New Testament, zero are attested in manuscripts dated to the first century. There are no manuscripts of the New Testament that are extant from the first century. Okay. Nothing from the first century of Christianity. The earliest complete copies of the Gospels are from the fourth century. That's 300 years after Jesus. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, um, let's see here. No, let's, uh, we're not going to talk about this. Okay. Now, we said that a radical revisionist is someone who swims against the tide of the historical consensus, right? Maybe he has good reasons for doing so, maybe not. Uh, such a man was John Wansborough. Okay, that's a name that you should be familiar with, John Wansborough. He was a famous professor uh, and vice chancellor at the University of London's School of Oriental and African Studies, also known as SOAS, from 1985 to 1992, John Wansborough. And Wansborough had uh, many famous and prolific students like Andrew Rippon and Patricia Crone, uh, Michael Cook. So here's, here's the problem with these Orientalists and their students, that they tend to make um, and continue to make some very tenuous assumptions about the Quran. They assume that the Bible and the Quran have, have, have similar literary histories. This is a big mistake. So in my view, the Bible and the Quran are in different universes. There's no, no disrespect. Um, and these Orientalists even employed the sw same sort of terminology, right? They call the Uthmani Codex, the Vulgate, or the Masoretic Text, or the Textus Receptus. They want to draw these analogs to the Islamic tradition. Now, one of the major critical assumptions of these Orientalists is the following. They'll say that since the Gospels were written after Jesus, peace be upon him, the Quran must have also been written after the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa Okay. Now, most historians, whether they're confessional or non-confessional, not all, but most, will place the composition of the canonical Gospels between 70 and 100 of the Common Era in the order of uh, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Okay, that's, that's pretty standard. That's a, a general consensus among New, New Testament historians. This is not controversial. This is not revisionist. It's very standard, very mainstream. Now, John Wansborough gained worldwide popularity a few decades ago by positing the proposition that the Qur'an was written in the second half of the 8th century in Iraq by a committee of various authors from the Abbasid court. So he was saying that the Qur'an was composed during this time. It was created during this time. There's no history before this time, according to him. So Wansborough basically conceded, when you think about it, that a solitary, unlettered man living in the Hejaz in the seventh century could not have possibly written such a literary masterpiece. Right? It must have been a committee of court theologians and poets and historians. Now, why was Wansborough so influential during his time several decades ago? I think there are three reasons, and I've highlighted them here on the slide. Generally, Western scholars tend to underestimate the importance of oral transmission they require what's known as external evidence, that is to say, physical evidence, physical manuscripts. And during the days of Wandsborough, advanced Western studies of Quranic manuscripts was just starting to take off. So many academics sided with Wandsborough due to the apparent lack of extant Quranic manuscripts that were dated to the first century of the Hijrah. The second reason is, again, due to a bad assumption just as we don't have any extant uh, New Testament manuscripts that are dated to the first century, the century of Jesus, peace be upon him, there are also probably no extant Quranic manuscripts from the first century Hijri, the century of the Prophet Muhammad And the third reason why I think Western revisionism takes root when it comes to Islam is because Orientalists tend to employ what's known as a hermeneutic of suspicion. Okay, so this idea that we as Westerners cannot really trust anything that comes out of the East. And by the East, I mean the Muslim East. We must be suspicious about their claims. 
right? So, you know, according to the Gospels, Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem to fulfill a prophecy. Zechariah chapter 9, the king of Zion comes to Jerusalem humbly seated upon a donkey. But when the Quran highlights similarities between Musa السلام, and the Prophet السلام, it's because the Prophet must have been aware of a prophecy of Deuteronomy chapter 18. A prophet like Moses would come, and so he claimed to be him, and then tried to imitate Moses in order to convince the Jews of Yathrib that he was a fulfillment of this prophecy. So you see, when Jesus, peace be upon him, does something, he's authentically fulfilling prophecy. But when the prophet Muhammad وسلم, does something, he's deceptively self-fulfilling prophecy. This is called a hermeneutic of suspicion, using a double standard. Right? So you hear this a lot from like a Christian apologist. He'll say, the Prophet ﷺ cannot be a prophet because he was a warrior. And a true prophet wouldn't engage in a war. Really? You ever read the Bible? Pick a page at random in the Old Testament. Right? According to the Old Testament, book of Exodus, Musa السلام, ordered 3,000 men killed in a single day. One day, 3,000 men put to the sword. Uh, if you look, if you ask our historians about the Ghazawat of the Prophet ﷺ, um, they'll say that maybe 1,500 men total were killed during the entire life of the Prophet ﷺ. And this was in battle, so something like 1,000 mushrikeen and 500 sahaba in 23 years, 1,500 on the battlefield, all men. <laughs> right? Compare that to 3,000 men in one day put to the sword by Musa. But Musa ﷺ is a prophet, and the Prophet ﷺ is not a prophet because he was a warrior. Right? You see this double standard. Even in the New Testament, book of Revelation, chapter 19, we have this, you know, description of Jesus, peace be upon him, in his second coming. Right? He's waging war, he strikes down the nations, his garment is soaked in the blood of his enemies. This is how he's described in the New Testament. Okay. So on one side we have the narrative in our, in our sources, like the Itqan of Suyuti, chapter 18 in particular, that the Suwar and Ayat of the Qur'an were first uttered by the historical Muhammad وسلم, of Arabia, and then the text of the Quran was standardized uh, by the Uthmanic Codex Committee around uh, 650 of the Common Era, uh, less than two decades after the Prophet. On the other side, we have the revisionist narrative that the Quran is a later sort of post-prophetic, that is to say, eighth century state-sponsored production and that the historical Muslim narrative about the Qur'an standardization is wholly fictitious. So whose narrative is supported by evidence? Okay, let's look at the evidence then. Let's look at the Qur'an's attestation in its first century. So remember we said the New Testament attestation in its first century is not extant. There, there's nothing. There are no manuscripts in the first century of Christianity. So, so here we're looking at the Qur'an's attestation in its first century. So we're not talking about the biography of the Prophet I'm not talking about Sira, like biographical sources. I'm talking about the Quran. Okay? So the first Islamic century corresponds roughly to the years 622 to 722, but I will limit things to only the seventh century. So 699 of the Common Era is sort of the latest date. There are over two dozen confirmed first century Hijri, that is, seventh century CE, manuscripts of the Quran extant right now, and many others out there waiting to be identified. Okay. And scholars believe that this number will definitely increase <clears throat> as more manuscripts await to be analyzed in their paleography, orthography, and radiocarbon dating. So maybe the most famous manuscript is called Mingana 1572a. This is, uh, that's this technical catalog name, but you know it probably if you know about this. The Birmingham Manuscript. Okay, so the Birmingham Manuscript was, uh, was initially misdated as a second century Hijri manuscript, primarily because the script was wrongly identified as being Kufic. It is in fact Hijazic. So in, in 2011, a, a Hungarian graduate student named Alba Fideli, she's now Dr. Fideli, uh, she had the manuscript radiocarbon dated on a hunch, and the results were stunning. It was dated no later than 645 of the Common Era. 
with a 95.4% accuracy. So that is 13 years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. So that is right around the time Uthman became the third caliph. Now, furthermore, manuscript 328C was identified as coming from the same codex as the Birmingham manuscript. Okay, so this comes out to about 8% of the Quran, 8%. Uh, dated to within 13 years of the Prophet ﷺ at the absolute latest. I mean, based on this dating, one could make the case that Mingana 1572a and Manuscript 328c was originally a companion codex. In other words, a mushaf of an unknown companion of the Prophet ﷺ. And Manuscript 1572a uh, contains the beginning of Surah Taha. So it's possible that this was a very manuscript that Umar read and caused his conversion, if that story in the Sirah is, is accurate. We have to take Sirah with a, with a grain of salt. But is it just this 8%? How much of the entire Quran is attested in manuscript witnesses from the first century Hijri? The answer is the entirety of the Uthmanic text. Okay, there's a website called Islamic Awareness. It's a pretty good website. Uh, and it's listed all Quranic manuscripts that are dated within the first Islamic century. And there's pictures of them. Um, and according to the researchers who run this site, Islamic Awareness, these manuscripts constitute up to 96% of the Quran. However, Dr. Sitli believes that this data is outdated and that it's closer to 100% of the Quran. We have 100% of the Quran in extant manuscripts uh, from the first Islamic century. Okay, so this is the opinion of Dr. Haitham Sitli, Dr. Marain Van Putin, Dr. Sean Anthony, and these are Western scholars. And you know, I obviously hope, they obviously hold certain opinions that, that we won't agree with, uh, and I'll talk about that. But when it comes to the attestation of the Quran, we are all in agreement. Okay, the entirety of the text is attested in the first century Hijri. This is without question. And furthermore, modern stylometric analysis was conducted on the Qur'an, revealing that the Qur'an had one author. It's one man, one person. So John Wansborough and his ilk have been, what? Definitively falsified. Right? They were wrong. Right? But as they say, people like this don't die easily. You know, Marx is still alive. Right? So you know what the revisionists are saying now? They're saying that the Quran must have been written before the Prophet ﷺ. So they swing to the other extreme, right? So they're saying something like, I don't know, the, the Prophet found the Quran uh, in, in Mecca sometime and he liked it and then he claimed that he received it as a revelation. So this is nothing but wishful thinking. There's no good evidence for this, but they have to say something, right? So first the Qur'an was written after, now it's before, but it can't be during the life of the Prophet. Right? So you see, this is called inad. This, and the Qur'an talks about this obstinacy. Right? It's like a child who says, I want some jelly beans. And the parents say, you have to eat dinner first. No, I want the bag of jelly beans. I want the whole bag now. No, you have to eat dinner. No, I want the jelly beans. No, you have to eat dinner. Okay, fine. So the kid eats dinner and says, here's some jelly beans. I don't want any now. Just vacillating between extremes. <laughs> that was the best analogy I can come up with. Okay, so according to Dr. Sitley, the process of manuscript dating has become actually much more accurate in, in recent years. So some manuscripts, Quranic manuscripts, have been reconsidered and dated earlier because the scientific testing is getting better. It's improving. So there are a lot of manuscripts that were considered second century that are now being moved into the first century of the Hijra. Okay, for example, Dr. Sitki mentions a manuscript called Sarai Medina 1A. It's in Turkey, and it, it was believed to be second century, but now the, the dominant opinion is that it's a first century manuscript written in Hijazic and Kufic, which is more or less the entire Quran. Um, other first century manuscripts, they're listed here, the, the top capi um, manuscript in Turkey, which 99% of the Quran. There's something called the Tubigin manuscript, which is 26% of the Quran, dated no later than 675. There's something called the Codex Parisino Petropolitanus, kind of a mouthful, 46%. You have Codex BL, that's British Library, OR 2165. 
Codex Meshhad, Codex 331, Codex 330G, and then the, the Marcel Codices. And then you have something called the Sun'a Palimpsest. You see that at the bottom, towards the bottom there? The Sun'a Palimpsest. This is also called Sun'a 1 or C1, which is 41% of the Quran, but a different textual tradition than the other manuscripts. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But by and large, it's identical to the Uthmani textual tradition. But we have to talk about why it's slightly different. And this is a great topic. And this is a topic that's being exploited by anti-Muslim polemicists. This would have demonstrated the Quran is not preserved. But this, this, this discovery only supports the Muslim narrative. I'll show you how it completely backfires on the polemicists. Keep that in mind. We're gonna, we have to talk about that later. C1, the Sun'a Palimpsest. This was, a man, this was a manuscript of the Quran that was discovered in 1972 in Yemen that is slightly different than the Uthmani textual tradition. Okay. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. It, some of them destroyed. Some some of them were written on. They were written on um, uh, in, in codices that just sort of wear over time. Some of them were probably divided amongst. A lot of these are probably family Qurans that were divided amongst family members. Um, some of them are are just partial Qurans because at this point, and we'll talk about this. Um, Orality took precedence over actual written text. Uh, so if you had something memorized, there's no need to write it down. So basically the written text was a memory aid in, in the first generation. Okay, so, the, so, so uh, Western scholars, they make the, another critical assumption that if a companion did not write something down, then he must not have believed it was the Quran. That's a bad assumption. And we'll, we'll talk about that, inshallah. Yeah. Just to give you an example, there's, Apparently, the Mus'haf of Ibn Mas'ud did not have Al-Fatiha or the last two Mu'awadatain, Surah 113 and 114. So Western scholars say, then he didn't believe that these were surahs. But it's interesting, that's the first and the last page of his Mus'haf, which are the first pages to get destroyed over wear and tear, right? <laughs> but we'll talk about that. That's a, that's a very important topic that is constantly brought up. Um, yes, any more questions? Good question. Yes. Sir, so you're saying that if we take the revisionist position, uh, how would a revisionist explain uh, specific people mentioned in the Quran, like the Prophet Islam and Zayd, who's a companion? Exactly, you know, it's, it doesn't, it's, it, that's why it's a radical revisionist position, you know. So Wandsboro, I mean, his, his, his insanity doesn't really end there. He'll say that there never was a historical Muhammad, that this entire thing is fictitious. It was invented as a political sort of strategy to sort of take over that part of the world, right, to unite sort of Jews, Christians, and together in this, Jewish Christian movement sort of coalesce into this new movement called Islam, right? Um, so they would say that these stories are just invented. So they're, they're claiming that there's someone named Zayd or Muhammad or whoever. And these stories about specific sort of events in the Quran, uh, these are just invented by the authors to, make, to give the impression that this is actual historical information. No one believes this anymore except they Radical, radical revisionist. But you'll get people like this, right? You'll have people who have really strange opinions. And they have PhDs, some of them. Right? That doesn't mean anything. Anyway, we'll talk more about that, inshallah. All right, so, moving on here. Aha, let's talk about the ahruf in the qara'at. So, this is very, very important. This is like the essence of it right here, okay? So if you've been sleeping up to this point, now is the time to wake up, inshallah. So I would translate ahruf as recitational variations. It's very difficult to tra translate ahruf. 
Okay. Um, and qira'at is canonical reading traditions. Okay, so the ahruf, very important topic. And this word is being now weaponized by anti-Muslim Christian polemicists in a major way. They are the ones that are presenting this topic to many Muslims for the first time. That's, a, that's not good. When a Christian polemicist, an anti-Muslim Christian polemicist who's trying to convert you to Christianity, is, is, is the first person you hear about these, these things from, then that's, that's not a good sign, right? Okay, it's, it's well established in our tradition that the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu upon seven letters, literally. Sometimes translated as seven modes. Again, I prefer seven types of recitational variations. From our perspective, the ahruf are revelation. They are by design. They're not by accident. The essential purpose of these ahruf, these variations, is twofold. The first is theological. The ahruf enrich our understanding of the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So by making the Quran a multiformic text, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up different meanings for us. We're enriched intellectually and spiritually by the ahruf. The ahruf give us a, di a deeper engagement with the kalam of Allah. I'll give you examples, inshallah. The second purpose of the ahruf is practical. The ahruf are a means of taysir. They make the Quran's recitation and memorization easier for us. They give us options. Okay? There are multiple correct readings. There is recitational latitude. And this is out of God's mercy. Again, this is by design, not accident. The presence of the seven ahruf is ma'lum min ad -din. This is something that is well known and established in the religion. It cannot be denied. It's not some secret. It's mentioned in numerous ahadith across multiple volumes. Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, An nasai Muslim, Ahmad, Muwata, Malik, Musannaf, Ibn Abi Shayba, etc., etc. Over 20 sahaba mentioned this in our hadith corpus. It's considered by many mutawatir lafdi. What is mutawatir lafdi? It means mass transmitted in its very wording. And the most eminent secular textual critics and historians of today maintain that the tradition of the seven ahruf likely goes back, most likely goes back directly to the Prophet ﷺ himself because of the popularity and antiquity of this tradition. In other words, the tradition of the seven ahruf was not invented by later Muslim scholars as a way of explaining why there's recitational variance in the Quran. Historically, the source of the tradition of the Ahruf was the Prophet ﷺ, and he used it as a way of explaining why there was recitational variance in the Quran. So that is very important. So just a couple of hadith here. The Prophet ﷺ said according to Ibn Abbas, anhu, recorded by Imam Bukhari, Allah he said, Aqra'ani Jibril ala harf, falam azal. That Gabriel read the Quran to me in, in one harf, one mode, and I continue to ask for increase until it reached seven ahruf. The other hadith here from Imam Ahmad, this is probably the most famous one. There was a dispute between Umar and Hisham. So Umar radiallahu anhu and Hisham ibn Hakim radiallahu anhu. They each read the same verse from Surah Al-Furqan differently. Okay? There was a slight difference. They went to the Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, the hadith says that Umar dragged Hisham by his collar to the Prophet ﷺ. So you see, the Muslims from the very beginning were very intent on getting the Qur'an exactly right. Okay? And investigating readings that were questionable. The Prophet ﷺ asked Umar to recite. Umar recited, and the Prophet said, Hakada unzilat. Like this it was revealed. And then the Prophet asked Hisham to recite. So Hisham recited. And the Prophet said, Hakada unzilat. Like this it was revealed. And then he concluded by clarifying a famous statement, Inna hadha al Quran unzila ala sabati ahruf, faqra'u ma tayassara. Indeed, the Qur'an was revealed in seven modes, or seven ahruf. So recite what is easy for you. And just a third report, Imam Muslim reports, that Ubay ibn Ka'ab said that he entered the mosque and he heard the recitation of two other companions that were different from each other as well as different from his own. 
So he says, a type of doubt, he says, entered into his heart. So even a great companion like Ubay ibn Kaab was initially puzzled by this multiformic aspect of the Qur'an. It's very unique to the Qur'an. Then the Prophet ﷺ explained the ahruf and their purpose to him, and the doubt left him. So this hadith actually supports our narrative that there were several companion reading traditions before the standardization of the text by the Uthmani Codex Committee. Okay, this was what the committee had to work with, and we'll talk about that, uh, inshallah. Very important. The Uthmanic Codex Committee. Um, there are many other reports as well, but here's the main point I want to emphasize again, is that it is most probable historically, historically, that the Prophet ﷺ himself is the source of these recitational variations in the Qur'an. That he recited the Qur'an in various ways, and that he claimed that the reason for this was the seven ahruf. Now a Christian or an atheist or a secular historian will say that he doesn't believe that the Prophet is receiving these words from God. That's fine. Whether the Prophet is receiving revelation or not, it makes the most sense historically to attribute at least a portion of these textual variations to the Prophet himself. Okay? Now, a historian might claim that other recitational variations that Muslims regard as authentic sprang up after the Prophet as well. Okay? I mean, I don't agree with this, and I'll show you why. But I think it must be acknowledged by historians that the recitation of the Qur'an as a multiformic phenomenon has a prophetic provenance, that is to say, a prophetic origin. That at the very least, the starting point of these variations is not in the post-prophetic period. Okay? So I think that the most an unbeliever or, a, or skeptic could say is, okay, fine, the Prophet invented the concept of the Ahruf because he couldn't remember everything he had previously said. Of course, again, this is not a historical argument, but rather highly subjective, wishful thinking. Uh, so I think that denying the prophetic origin of the Ahruf is historically dishonest. And as I said, many eminent uh, non-Muslim uh, historians of the Qur'an will say, yeah, it, it probably started with him, because it's such an ancient and well-attested tradition of the seven Ahruf. Okay, now, anti-Muslim polemicists love to give Muslim lay people, like the general masses, the impression that the traditional ulama were not forthright about these things, like the seven ahruf, that the, the ulama were sort of um, uh, keeping these things a secret because they were afraid or embarrassed or something, that this would somehow compromise the preservation of the Qur'an, or that the ulama lied to them uh, and said that the Qur'an was a uniform text. This is totally false. All of the seminal kutub, on the topic of ulum al-Qur'an, all of them, written by traditional ulama of ahl sunnah wal jamaa all of them have a section on ahruf and qira'at. Okay? So this is not some secret teaching that Muslim scholars have been covering up, only to be uncovered by these honest and brave neo-orientalists, these textual Indiana Joneses. Thank God for that. Right? No, the seven ahruf has nothing to do with the preservation of the Qur'an, None of the ulama who wrote about the Ahruf said that the Qur'an was not preserved. Traditional scholars are very proud of the fact that the Qur'an was revealed ala sab'ati Ahruf. They praise and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Qur'an was revealed ala sab'ati Ahruf. This is an amazing and beautiful and elegant and unique aspect of the Qur'an. And you'll see what I mean when I give you examples. Okay? So the problem was never the ulama. The problem is the ill-informed preachers and apologists who create straw men narratives that anti-Muslim elements exploit. That's the problem. Miseducation, not education. Okay, so here's a quote from M.M. Al-A'zami, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. This is a fantastic book, by the way. It's called The History of the Quranic Text. I actually brought, this version of it is old. You're not going to find it like, like this anymore. There's a new yeah, version of it. but. M. M. Al Adami. This is a text in English that is probably the best text in English on this topic. The history of the Quranic text from revelation to compilation. And he, he, he also does a comparative study with the Old and New Testaments to make that comparison. So this is what he says. He says, although contemporary scholars outside the, the Islamic context have offered a range 
of imaginative interpretations to get to the quote real Quran, those unfamiliar with the Islamic intellectual tradition should remember that every last quote variant or quote alternate reading uses evidence that the classical Islamic account is inaccurate comes out from the Islamic intellectual tradition itself. Right? So what he's saying here is basically what we said before is that you have you have critics of Islam weaponizing our own our own literature against us by presenting these things to ignorant Muslim masses and saying the Quran is not preserved as if these things were not mentioned by the ulama. Okay. Now, there is a difference of opinion as to what exactly the ahruf are. Okay. But they are there. There's no doubt about this. And some opinions are stronger than others. So Imam Suyuti, he lays out all of these opinions in his masterpiece, Al-Idhan fi Ulum al-Quran. But essentially, there are three opinions, and there's overlap. The one opinion is that the seven ahruf are seven dialects of Arabic. This is the opinion of uh, Abu Ubaid Qasim ibn Salam, that the seven ahruf are seven dialects of Arabic. This is not a strong opinion, however. The explanatory power of this opinion is not, is not sufficient. The second opinion is that the ahruf are seven potential variations to any one word in the Quran, that any one word can have a maximum of seven different forms. For example, uh, um, that's one form. That's the second one. That's, so that's three of, of Sirat. It can have up to seven. That's another opinion. I believe this is Imam at Tabari's opinion. The third opinion is that the Ahruf are seven categories of recitational variants in the Quran. This is the opinion of Abu Fadl al Razi, Ibn Qutayba, uh, Imam al Jazari. The Ahruf are seven categories of recitational variants in the Quran, although different scholars have some slight differences in their final categorizations. And this is perhaps the strongest opinion. I think this has the strongest explanatory power. Again, the Ahruf are seven categories of recitational variants in the Quran that were all recited by the Prophet or approved by the Prophet And we'll demonstrate that, inshallah. Let's look at some examples. The first harf is nominal variation, okay? Nominal variation. In other words, variations in, in nouns. So this is one harf. There's a classic example, right? In Al-Fatiha. Maliki yawm al-deen, Maliki yawm al-deen. Right? Everyone knows this one. And they mean different things, right? Uh, Malik owner, Malik king. What's the difference? Well, you see a king may rule and set laws over a kingdom, but he may not necessarily own everything. An owner may own something, but he may not necessarily rule over anything. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is both owner and king. He rules and owns everything. If one of my teachers gave the analogy, the king of Morocco, imagine the king, he, there's a king in Morocco, but this king, even though he's the king, he can't just go into somebody's house and start taking pizza out of his fridge. That's not his, even though he's the king. He doesn't own that pizza, right? Um, an owner, you might own your house, but does that mean you can build a little masjid? On your front lawn, yeah. if you own a house in San Ramon, can you build a little masjid on your front lawn? No, you can't do that. Because the HOA will destroy you, right? But you say, I own this house, right? You're, you're the owner, but you're not the king of it, right? In other words, you, 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 don't, you don't set the rules, you don't make the laws, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is king and owner. So the Prophet recited it both ways. We know this. He recited it both ways. But the radical skeptic will say, how do you know that? How do you know? The Prophet recited it both ways. This just seems like Muslims are trying to cover up a discrepancy in their book. Okay, so this can be answered using common sense. We don't have to rattle off asanid, like chains of transmission, for this. So my contention is, the statement, the Prophet recited it both ways, is as factual as saying that Thomas Jefferson was the third president, or that Caesar Augustus was the first Roman emperor. It's just a fact. And people can question these things if they want. And again, like I said, there's people who always do. Like one of my teachers said that a Hindu graduate student wrote a PhD dissertation on how the Taj Mahal was actually built by Hindus. And it's a Hindu temple. Somebody wrote a PhD on this in past PhD. So there's always going to be people like this. So let's ask a basic question. How many times did the companions hear the Prophet recite Al-Fatiha? Okay. Let's think about this. I did the math. I mentioned this in the khutbah a few weeks ago. 
So the five daily prayers are mandated in the eighth year of the Meccan period. So Al-Fatiha must be recited, as we know, in every prayer cycle. Everyone knows this. So the Prophet ﷺ led the Sahaba in prayer for 15 years. 15 times 354 days, that's the lunar year, is 5,310 days. Three of the daily prayers are audible in their first two cycles, Fajr, Maghrib, and Isha. So they would have heard the Fatiha six times a day from the Prophet So 5,310 times six recitations a day is 32,000 recitations. The Sahaba heard the Prophet recite Al-Fatiha 32,000 times over the course of 15 years. And this is not counting uh, um, the times that he recited it in Salat al-Jumah, Salat al-Eid, or in outside of prayer, in conversations, and lectures, and sermons. So, did the companions of the Prophet really get Al-Fatiha wrong? Was there really a difference of opinion as to whether the Prophet said Malik or Malik? And did they transfer this uncertainty to their students? So this is just ridiculous. It's ridiculous, right? He obviously recited it both ways. The Quran was and continues to be a mass transmitted living tradition. It was constantly heard, recited, and memorized. Like some people would say, well, in the pre modern world, it was an oral cult culture, and you know, people were just sort of, they memorized everything, right? Um, and some modern historians would say that's not true. People made mistakes back then, and I agree, they made mistakes. But the Quran was constantly heard, recited, and memorized. Constantly. Every single day since its inception by dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of people. But the madness doesn't end there. Some Orientalists and modern Christian polemicists even go further into the Twilight Zone. And they claim that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the great companion, did not even believe that Al-Fatiha was part of the Quran. So this is ridiculous beyond comprehension. And we'll get there, inshallah. Uh, but there's a Harvard professor who makes this claim. I'll come back to this issue. Uh, okay, so I mentioned nominal variation as one harf, right? There's also inflectional variation. This is another harf, inflectional variation. So, and this has a theological and practical purpose. So, so with respect to practice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمْسَحُوا بِرُؤُسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ right? Anoint or wipe your heads and wash your feet for wudu. This verse also can be read, in the genitive, arjulikum. Do you guys see the difference? Oh, yeah, there's no Arabic here, but arjulakum in the transliteration, right? Arjulakum, that's with a a, fat'a, is called accusative, direct object. Arjulikum with the kasra, indirect object, genitive, case ending. So the first one says, wipe your heads and wash your feet. The second one says, wipe your heads and wipe your feet. You see, so generally we wash our feet during wudu, but there are circumstances where we can wipe our feet. When do we do that? Well, we have to look to the sunnah, the normative practice of the Prophet Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he could have revealed another verse that said, wipe your feet, but he didn't do that. He inspired the Prophet to recite the same verse, but with a slight adjustment. He inspired the Prophet with another form of the verse. This other form gives us an additional meaning. This is a testament to the distinctiveness and elegance of the Quran. Right? This is one of the reasons why the Quran is a sui generis, with one of a kind. No other book is like this. Now with, with respect to belief, here's another example at the bottom of the page here, or the slide. 1934 of the Quran says, Isa ibn Maryam, Such was Jesus, the son of Mary. Um, it is the word of truth about which they vainly dispute. You see, la, la with a fatha. So here the word qawl is in the accusative, meaning the aforementioned statement about Jesus. What we just mentioned about Jesus is the true account. Qawl al haq the Christological teaching found in the preceding ayat represents the true Jesus. That he is what? Nabiullah, prophet of God. Abdullah, slave of God. Not the son of God. That he's Mubarak, he's blessed. He's not Mal'un, as Paul says in Galatians. He calls Jesus Mal'un, accursed. He's not a deceiver or a blasphemer, as the Talmud says. Right? None of these things. Now this verse can also be read, that Isa ibn Maryam, قَوْلُ الْحَقِّ you see, قَوْلُ with dhamma, 
Now it's nominative. Okay, so now the verse means, such was Jesus, he is the word of truth. That Jesus is the word of truth about whom they are vainly disputing. Okay, so now Jesus is the word of Al-Haq, the word of Allah, which is an honorific title. It's takrimi, as Imam al-Razi explains. If someone is known for their generosity, you can say, he's generosity itself. So in other words, the Quran is highlighting the truthful speech of Isa alayhi salam. That everything he said was wahi. He only spoke the words of God. Therefore, he's called the word of God as a way of honoring and praising him. So why does the Quran praise him in this way and emphasize his truthfulness? Probably because the New Testament ascribes to Jesus false prophecies. That is to say, falsifiable predictions and blasphemy. Uh, while the Talmud ascribes to him deception and sorcery. Okay. So we see how the ahruf enrich the meanings of the ayat. Just a, a slight difference of a vowel. So this is an aspect of the utter uniqueness of the Quran. Okay. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. No, whenever you want to ask questions. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, not, not every verse has. So that's taking the other opinion that, that every verse or word of the Quran can have seven different variations. Um, so, no, I mean, I think the, the ayat were revealed to the Prophet um, um, in different ways. It's possible that he received different forms of the same ayat at the same time. But it's also possible that if he came into contact with Arabs that were of a different dialect, and we'll talk about that, his dialect does have something to do with the ahruf that he would recite it in a different dialect, and that's also a form of wahi. So I think these things happen sort of more organically. Yeah. Allahu mm -hmm. Yeah. Which one? Oh. This one? No. This one? Oh, I see. No, no, no. They're completely different. Yeah, we'll talk about that. That's, that's a common mistake. That the ahruf and the qira'at are synonymous. So warsh is a qara'a, but this, this qara'a of warsh is, is drawn from the seven ahruf, the pool of the seven ahruf. Okay, so I'll, I'll clarify, we're going to get to that inshallah. That's a very good topic. And we actually know the source of the confusion, why that happened, why Muslims started conflating ahruf and qara'at. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we'll get to that, inshallah. Yeah, that's a good, good question. Yeah, we'll talk about the Uthmani uh, Codex Committee and what happened after. How do we go from the Masahif to the Qira'at? Okay, but going back here to the Ahruf. Um, so here's a third type of Ahruf. This is called dialectical variation. Okay, so for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ Right? وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفْءًا أَحَدٍ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفْءًا أَحَدٍ Or we said, سِرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ السِرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ السِرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ السِرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Why? You see, the Arab was the first standard bearer of the religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala naturally facilitated things for the Arab and certain, uh, revealed certain words and phrases in different Arab dialects. Okay? 
So the Arab is going to take this message to the world. So this is the wisdom behind this harf. Okay. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا لِتُنْذِرَ أُمَّ الْقُرَى وَمَنْ حَوْلَهَا Thus we have revealed to you an Arabic Quran recital in order for you to admonish the mother of the cities, Mecca, and those around it. Okay. So this is, um, this is um, dialectical variation. One of my favorite dialectical variations is in Surat uh, Ibrahim, verse 35. So it says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ جْعَلْ هَذَا الْبَلَدَ آمِنَا But there's a variation that says, إِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهَامُ Ibrahim and Ibrahim. And it's only in this ayah. Okay. The fourth harf out of seven is called synonymic variation. So here's an ayah in Surah Al-Hujurat, ayah number six. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَئٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا O oh, you believe, if an immoral person brings you any news, investigate the truth. This verse is also read as Ya ayyuhaladina amanu in ja'akum fasikun bin nabain fatathabbatu. If an immoral person brings you any news, ascertain the truth. This is called synonymic variation. Investigate the matter, ascertain the truth. Both are true. Make tabyin and make tathbeet. Either one can be read in prayer because they both conform to the Uthmani Rasam, the consonantal skeleton, the shorthand text of the Uthmani codices, and are both authorized through Senad, through transmission. So you see the original Uthmani codices, and we'll get into the narrative here, did not have dots or vowel notations. No dots, no vowels, no Fatha Kasra Bamma, no Zer Zebr Pesh. So Fatabayanu and Fatathabatu are two authorized renditions of the consonantal skeleton of the Uthmani textual tradition. Th those are all right. All of those are right. All of those are correct. All of those are correct Arabic. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what they say, but that's incorrect. Yeah, so all three of those are authorized readings of, of the Fatiha that all have Asanid that go back to the Prophet so it's, it's, that's exactly the point I was making earlier, is that generally when Muslims hear this difference, they'll think, well, which one is right? Because we've been sort of trained in the thinking in, in, a sort of, in a certain type of way. But the Qur'an is, is different than that. The, the form of the Qur'an is very unique. It's multiformic. So there's different ways of reading the same ayat, right, that are all authorized. Okay, so it's all correct, it's all Arabic, and it all has Sanad. Now, if you, if you would have said, Ihdinas, um, I don't know, Firat al-Mustaqim, Firat. This is obviously, why is it wrong? Because there's no Sanad for this. It comes out of nowhere. It's spurious, it's isolated. It has no chain of transmission. It's not even correct Arabic. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other, um, yes. No, this, this doesn't change the meaning. Dialectical variations don't change the meaning. But other variations do. Nominal variation changes the meaning. Malik and Malik mean two different things. It comes from the same root, but they, they have two different meanings. Yeah. So it's also a misnomer to say, well, the, the, the Ahrab don't change the meaning. They do change the meaning. That's the point of it, is to change the meaning. That we can wash and wipe the feet. That's a difference in meaning. That can't be dialectical. So sometimes they change the meaning. But the dialectical ones, they don't change the meaning. It's just a different pronunciation. Yeah, the, the sod was different, was difficult on some Arabs. The Prophet was inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to recite it in their dialect, which is, a, which is okay. It's, it's, a, it's, it's classical Arabic, and it's authorized. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. So the remaining ahruf are verbal, particular, and syntactical. But I think these examples are sufficient. So nominal, inflectional, dialectical, synonymic, verbal, particular, and syntactical. Those are the seven ahruf, inshallah. And something very close. There might be some slight differences in these categorizations, but that's basically it. Now, Muslim scholars have described at length in the books of Ulum al-Quran that there were several readings in pre-Uthmanic companion codices that differed in their rasam. 
in their textual traditions from the Uthmani Rasam. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the history of the, of the Uthmanic textual tradition and make sense of these companion codices, these masahif of individual sahaba. Okay. So what happened between the revelation of the Quran and the standardization of the Uthmani textual tradition? So the Prophet he recited the Quran in prayers and lectures for 23 years, ala sab'ati ahruf, upon seven ahruf. He recited the Quran as a multiformic text. Various companions went home and they recorded what they heard from him in their personal codices. Okay? These included uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Ubay ibn Ka'ab and Abdullah ibn Abbas and the author of C1, the son of Palimpsest. We'll call him Companion X. Okay, and others. So these are the companion codices. Okay, um, so we have these various text types or textual traditions. This is the term that's used by textual scholars. So the textual tradition of Ibn Mas'ud, the textual tradition of Ibn Ka'b, the textual tradition of Abdullah Ibn Abbas, the textual tradition of Companion X. So according to the Muslim sources, during the Prophet's time, there was widespread memorization of the Qur'an, there were scribal recordings of the Qur'an, and there was an annual review of the Qur'an every Ramadan with the angel uh, Gabriel, alayhi salam. This review is called Al-Mu'arada. Now, if historians are hesitant to accept the latter, that's fine, but certainly it is a fact that in the Prophet's time, the recitation of the Qur'an was widespread and it was being written down, okay, that he had kutab al-wahi, in even very critical academics, they admit this, that he had scribes, official scribes. Now, the vast, vast majority of the texts of these companion codices were in total agreement. However, according to our literary tradition, there were some minor differences between them. Okay, and our traditional scholars wrote at length about these differences. So they did not see this as a problem of preservation at all. So our classical tradition can easily account for these differences. So we can say that they differed because of four things. Okay, the companion codices differed because of four things. Various orthographies. In other words, um, the companions spelled words in different ways. Okay, uh, using, they use different spelling conventions. So like in, you know, if I write, if I spell the word color on my, in Microsoft Word as C-O-L-O-R, that's fine. But if I put a U in there, it'll underline it in red. It's misspelled. But in England, that's, that's the correct spelling. Right, different dialect. Okay, this does not affect the meaning whatsoever. Um, number two, variants due to the revealed ahruf where the rasam was different. Okay, and I'll give you possible examples of this. Scribal errors, i.e. misremembering the exact syntax or the exact wording. And I'll give you possible examples. And then differences due to exegetical glosses or notes made by companions in their personal codices. And I'll give you possible examples. Inshallah. Okay, but let's continue the narrative here. So, okay, so various companions, they go out into the Muslim world, right, the newly conquered lands. This was before the Uthmanic standardization, so prior to 650 of the Common Era. And these companions, they take their textual traditions with them. So Ibn Mas'ud goes to Iraq, and Ubay ibn Ka'b goes to Syria, and Companion X goes to Yemen. So multitudes of people are becoming Muslim in these lands. And at some point, the Muslims in these lands outside of Medina begin to become aware of or come into contact with other textual traditions, textual traditions that they did not know about. And these textual traditions are slightly different than what they were taught by their teachers. So this causes a bit of unrest in the provinces. So the Caliph Uthman, radiallahu anhu, he's informed of this unrest. So he forms a codex committee in Medina around 650 of the Common Era, maybe a few years earlier. So he then attempted to recall all of these various manuscripts floating around the provinces because he's going to standardize the text based upon the dominant readings of the Quran in Medina at that time. In other words, the most prevalent readings of the companions. Okay. He's also going to write the rasam, the consonantal skeleton, the shorthand text of the Quran, in the orthography of the Quraysh, the Qurayshi dialect of Arabic, because this was 
the Prophet's tribe, and the majority of the Quran was revealed in this dialect. So these actions more or less stabilize the text once and for all. Now, different scholars, they suggest that the Uthmani textual tradition was likely a critical addition itself. And I think this is consistent with our narrative. In other words, the Uthmani textual tradition was drawn out from the various companion textual traditions that were present in Medina. So the companion Zayd ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhu, he called for these manuscripts, and they were checked against each other, and then checked against the memories of the Hufav, who served on the Codex Committee. And only those readings that were the most widespread and popular were recorded in the various Uthmani codices that would be sent out into the regional provinces, into the Amsar. Okay, um, his diagram will help us a little bit. So, according to Sitqi and Van Putin, Sean Anthony and others, all extant Quranic manuscripts today descend from a single text type, the Uthmani text type, the Uthmani textual tradition. That is their textual stemma, that's the sort of technical term, means textual family. All extant manuscripts except for one, the lower text of C1, the, the Yemeni palimpsest, and we have to talk about that. Okay, but all of these scholars maintain that C1 and the Uthmani texts share a common ancestor. And a scholar named Sadiqi calls this ancestor the prophetic archetype. C1 was a very important discovery. Okay, we'll see more about it later, um, inshallah. But I think that with the discovery of C1, which is likely a companion codex, we can say now with a strong degree of confidence that the verse order in the companion codices was very fixed. In other words, the structure of the surahs was stable, but not necessarily the surah order. Okay, although the surah order is generally longest to shortest, but this doesn't really matter. So the word surah in Arabic uh, means a fence or an enclosure. So each surah in the Quran is a standalone, coherent literary unit. So the, the order of the surahs is not uh, essential. So in C1, we'll talk more about C1, two verses are transposed and one verse was clearly accidentally skipped. So these were scribal errors. We'll come back to that, inshallah. But look at the, the diagram on the slide here. So the letter P at the top stands for the prophetic archetype. This represents all of the Quranic recitations of the Prophet ala sab'ati ahruf. Okay, everything that was recited by the Prophet There are various arrows shooting down from the letter P. At the end of one arrow, we see I M, that's Ibn Mas'ud. At the end of another arrow, we see C1, that's the Sun'a Palimpsest and then C2, C3, etc. These represent the companion codices. These are the various companion textual traditions that contain minor differences due to various spelling conventions, variations in the ahruf, possible scribal errors, and possible exegetical notes. So this is what Zayd had to work with. Now under each companion textual tradition, there are arrows shooting down but converging upon a single point. We can call this point the Uthmani textual tradition. Okay, So the Uthmani textual tradition is a critical addition that incorporated the strongest readings from the existing companion textual traditions, which were themselves eyewitness recordings of the prophetic archetype. So in essence, what we recite today is an eclectic compilation of the most widely attested readings of the prophetic archetype, the best of the best, gathered from the companion textual traditions in Medina and checked against the memories of the Quran memorizers and masters. Okay? How long did it take? Um, how long did it take? Um, I, I, I don't know. I can check on that, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. It was started and completed during his lifetime. Yeah. Yes? Uh, probably more. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we'll get there, inshallah. Yeah. Okay. So the committee could not have done a better job when you think about it. 
the, the master Uthmani codex is called the Imam manuscript. So this, this uh, the, the master codex was copied at least three times and sent to the Amsar, the regional provinces. Um, there's an Andalusian scholar named Abu Amr al-Dani who wrote a book called Al-Muqni'r, which is a major reference when it comes to Qara'at and Masahis. And he's, he's cited several times by Imam Suyuti. And according to Adani, there were four Uthmani codices, Medina, Kufa, Basra, and Syria. But he mentions there could have been up to seven. And then uh, Dr. Sitki con conducted something called phylogenetic analysis. Okay, so this is something that's used in biology to track evolutionary sort of history of organism. Um, and this analysis generated these various stemmas or family trees of manuscripts. I don't know exactly how it all works, but he does. This is some really like cutting edge stuff. But basically, Dr. Sitki analyzed and aggregated all of the extant Quranic manuscripts that he can get his hands on. And he concluded that all of them go back to four ancestral codices. Okay, with the exception of C1. We'll talk about that. So all extant manuscripts go back to Medina, Basra, Kufa, and Syria. And then based on the carbon dating, he says, the, the, the time window is consistent with 650 of the Common Era, the time of the Caliph Uthman. So Sidki concludes, as does others, Van Putin and Nikolai Sinai, that the broad strokes, as it were, of the traditional Muslim narrative of the Quran standardization by Uthman around 650 is historically accurate. This is what the physical manuscript evidence points to. The physical manuscript evidence points to the historicity of the standard Muslim narrative. So John Wandsboro is refuted again. Uh, Dr. Nazir Khan, there's a, there's a beautiful um, essay. You can look it up. Nazir Khan on, on the um, variants in the Quran. He says that the, tradi the traditional Muslim narrative is true because, quote, the absence of any, of any compelling evidence to challenge it, as well as, quote, the presence of considerable data in its support. And then Sitki further says that the algorithm suggests that the Medinan Codex is likely the Uthmanic archetype. In other words, the Basran, Kufan, and Syrian codices were copied from the Medinan. The Medinan Codex was the first codex that was produced. This is what the evidence shows, physical evidence. Okay. Now let's look a bit closer at this. Um, I said there are four reasons for differences in the companion codices. Oh, well, I, I think I skipped this slide. Here's what I was saying earlier. The Uthmanic textual tradition is a critical edition that took the strongest readings from the existing companion textual traditions, which were themselves eyewitness recordings of the prophetic archetype. And then a note here, Abu Amr al-Dani, um, in his book al muknir that there were four Uthmanic codices, Medina, Kufa, Basra, and Syria. And then Dr. Sitki's phylogenetic analysis confirms the Muslim narrative. And now the sort of general historical consensus among secular historians is to confirm the sort of essential historical veracity of the standard Muslim narrative. So here's something interesting here. So the top of this says skeletal, that is rasmi, variants in the textual tradition of Ibn Mas'ud versus the textual tradition of Uthman. Okay? So, we don't have the Mus'haf of Ibn Mas'ud. It's not extant. We only read about it. Okay? The, the, the only potential companion codices that we have are C1, that was discovered in Yemen, and the Birmingham manuscript. Okay? But we have no external evidence of Ibn Mas'ud's Mus'haf, his codex. And C1 is definitely not his codex. Now, I should mention, some contemporary Muslim scholars have argued that there never was a Mus'haf of Ibn Mas'ud. Okay, so like M.M. Adami, in this book, he explains this argument in chapter 13. Um, he, chapter 13 is called the so-called Mus'haf of Ibn Mas'ud and the alleged variances therein. Um, personally, I'm not convinced by this argument. Um, I, don't, I think it's an interesting argument when you engage it, but it's not very compelling in my opinion. I think Ibn Mas'ud definitely did have a Mus'haf. What happened to his codex? What happened to his Mus'haf? Was it recalled by Uthman? Um, probably not. I mean, one of the students of Imam al-Kisa'i um, named uh, Yahya al-Farah in Kufa, he actually said that he saw a, a physical copy 
of the Codex of Ibn Mas'ud at the end of the second century. Uh, so we have eyewitness testimony to, to his ex existence way after Uthman. Now, was this a fake or a fabrication? Was it the original or a copy? Allahu alam. But anyway, um, there, there is a report in Ibn Abu Dawood that Uthman did decree that all personal fragments of the Quran that differed from the Uthmani Mus'haf be destroyed. But Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he mentioned that it was possible that people erased the ink rather than burned or destroyed their manuscripts. And of course, the lower text we'll see of C1 was actually erased. However, Ibn Mas'ud's codex apparently survived well into the 8th century. So nonetheless, we'll just uh, uh, suppose that it existed. It is reported that in the textual tradition of Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Mas'ud read Surah 101 like this, Al-Qari'ah. So, Al-Qari'atu ma al-Qari'ah wa ma adraka ma al-Qari'ah yawma yakunu nasu kal farash al-mabathuth. Okay, uh, so far so good. وَتَكُونَ الْجِبَالُ كَسُوفِ الْمَنْفُوشِ سُوفِ الْمَنْفُوشِ Now what does the Uthmani textual tradition say? وَتَكُونَ الْجِبَالُ كَالْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ So Ibn Mas'ud says, the mountains will be like carded suf. Uthman says, the mountains will be like carded ihn. Yeah. So what, what can account for this difference? Why is there a difference, number one? There are three possible reasons. Number one, this was an example of synonymic variation, one of the seven ahruf. In other words, at times, in order to facilitate comprehension and retention for various Arab tribes, the Prophet ﷺ would recite verses in various ways, and sometimes a word with a similar meaning would be used for another word, because the latter was not known or not popular among a given tribe. So suf and ihin are synonymous. They both mean wool, wool. Okay, it doesn't make a difference at all which word is used in the context of this verse. So the Prophet ﷺ recited it both ways. This was a function of the ahruf. At times, the Prophet's readings had this type of recitational latitude for the sake of taysir al-faham, for the sake of facilitating understanding. That's one possibility. Another possibility that I intimated earlier is that this is simply an error that Ibn Mas'ud erroneously wrote down the wrong word. He remembered it wrong. The Sahaba were not infallible. A third possibility is that he wrote Suf somewhere in his codex. Of course, we don't have the codex. We're speculating. But he wrote the word Suf somewhere in his codex, okay, um, maybe above or below the verse, as a tafsiri note, an exegetical note. In other words, to remind himself that Ihin means Suf, maybe because he wasn't familiar with the word Ihin. And so he wrote down a synonym. But then later, some of his students maybe thought that he was correcting the Mus'haf or that he was saying that either one could be recited as a function of the Ahruf. Okay? We do know that, uh, I mean, Imam al-Baqilani, he mentioned that, that, that Sahaba did write tafsiri notes in their Masahib. Imam al-Jazari mentioned this as well, that they would clarify things for themselves in their Masahib. So these were their personal codices, right? And so they would write their personal notes in their personal codices, just like you write notes in your books. Sometimes people annotate their books. Uh, so these notes in the companion codices were really the first form of tafsir, Quranic exegesis in Islam. Okay, so in, in the, in the Sen'a palimpsest that we'll look at, the author wrote at the beginning of the ninth surah, he said, لا تقول بسم الله. This is what he wrote. It's obviously not, he's not writing the Quran here. This is obviously a note to himself, to remind himself, not to say Bismillah before reading Surah to Tawbah. Okay. But for the sake of argument, let's go with the first possibility. Let's say that Ibn Mas'ud recited it as Suf because this is what he heard the Prophet recite. Okay, okay, fine. And there are reports that Ibn Mas'ud refused to submit his Mus'haf because he said that he learned these readings from the Prophet himself. That's fine. Now, even though Ibn Mas'ud's textual tradition was popular in Iraq, okay, it's very likely that there were several companions in Medina who learned the Qur'an from him. So he was a great teacher of the Qur'an. So it's very likely that there were companions in Medina who recited verse 5 of Surah 101 as Kasuf al-Manfush. So why does the Uthmani textual tradition say Ihin and not Suf? Why? It's very simple. This is very, very simple. 
The latter reading, which Suf, was just not widely attested in Medina at the time of the Codex Committee. So Suf, okay, fine, was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. But for the sake of stabilizing the text, it was abandoned by the Codex Committee. Now you might say, um, how can they abandon something from the Qur'an? That's a good question. How is this not tahrifun nas? How is this not uh, textual corruption? How is this not naskh abrogation? So let's start with the latter. So with respect to naskh, no one other than the Prophet ﷺ can abrogate anything from the Qur'an. Okay, by Allah's leave. Perhaps Suf was abrogated by the Prophet ﷺ in his final mu'arada with Jibreel salam, in his final review with Gabriel. And Zayd and his committee knew about this. So then Ihin reflects the Prophet's final recension with Gabriel. But again, let's say for argument's sake that it was not abrogated, that both readings were valid. How can the Codex Committee abandon the Suf reading? Again, this is very, very simple. So the Ahruf are a form of Rukhsa. Okay? Rukhsa means what? Concession, alleviation, special permission. Okay? So the Quran was revealed in seven Ahruf to make understanding easier. And a Rukhsa, by rule, may be abandoned. For example, if you travel during Ramadan, right? You do not have to fast, right? You can take that rukhsa and not fast, or not take it and fast. It's your choice. So the Codex Committee made the choice to stabilize the rasam upon one harf when it came to this verse, rather than to have one Uthmani Codex say suf and another Uthmani Codex say ihin, because this would have potentially led to the very same type of unrest in the provinces that the Codex Committee was specifically formed to quell. It would have defeated the purpose. Okay, so this was not naskh, this was not abrogation of the Qur'an. This was abandoning a concession, abandoning a rukhsa. Neither was this tahrif, textual corruption. Tahrif would have been to change a word to another word that was not found in any companion codex or any manuscript recited by a known companion. For example, if the, if the Codex Committee uh, wrote, وَتَكُونَ الْجِبَالُ كَالْوَبَرِ الْمَنْفُوشِ Wabar. Wabar means, also means wool, basically. Just an example of a word that is totally unattested in this verse. So this would have been tahrif. This would have been textual corruption. But if the, but if the Codex Committee had decided to fabricate or, or corrupt the Qur'an, then they would have been confronted by dozens and dozens and hundreds of other sahaba, right, who would have made life very difficult for the committee. Right? Now, somebody might say, well, Uthman was assassinated. Right? Yes, he was. Six years later, he was killed by foreign rebels who accused him of nepotism. So it was, it was political. Now, there are some biographers who do mention that some people were upset with him because of his standardization of the Quran. But I think this is just natural. I mean, you can't make everyone happy. Right? So there, but there's no strong evidence whatsoever that any companions were upset with him regarding the Codex. The Sahaba were universally pleased with the actions of the committee. Mm -hmm. that, possibly. That's, that's possible. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that this is simply an error that he made. He, he remembered the wrong word. Another possibility is that he wrote the word Suf in the margin of his Codex to remind him that Ihn means Suf. But then over time, his students uh, believed that he maybe was correcting the codex. Or he was saying you can recite either one. We don't really know. Right? So I'm taking, I'm, taking the position, I'm taking the position that, okay, for argument's sake, it was revealed both ways. We don't know that for certain. We don't even have his mus'af. This is all things that we're reading about his mus'af. Yeah, it's, it seems like it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, this, this is the type of thing that these Christian polemicists, this, this is the hill they want to die on. Suf or ihin, right? This is, I mean, it's, it's really desperation, right? And again, this is, um, this. With. No, there's, there's several differences. 
Yeah, there's several differences. But by and large, it's exactly the same. But there are a few differences. And we can explain these differences, the differences, um, uh, through our traditions, right? Um, but here's, here's, a, here's just to compare this to a variant reading in the New Testament. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, the only begotten Son, no one has ever seen God, the only begotten God. So you can see how that's a big difference. Is he the only begotten Son of God, or is he the only begotten God? Right? So this is very different than Suf and Ihim. Right? <laughs> Completely different. Now, what about the Hadith? So this is a Hadith that Christian polemicists love to quote. It's in Bukhari. And this Hadith is supposed to like shatter our narrative. Right? But again, it actually supports our narrative. <laughs> so there's a hadith that says, the Prophet he said, خُذُوا الْقُرْآنَ مِنْ أَرْبَعَةً مِنْ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ مَسْعُودِ وَالسَّالِمْ وَمُعَاذِ وَأُبَيْ بِنُ كَعْبِ Take the Qur'an from four. Ibn Mas'ud, and then Salim, Mu'adh, and Ubay ibn Ka'b. So first thing, he did not say only these four. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned these four because they were the most eminent teachers of the Qur'an in his day. Okay, but here the Christian polemicist says, Aha! The Prophet said, take the Qur'an from Ibn Mas'ud. Yet the Codex Committee abandoned many of his readings. Gotcha, Mr. Muslim. So this is just a, a stupid argument. Let's, let's think about this. When the Prophet ﷺ made this statement, what did the companions do? Did they just ignore him? No, they obviously listened to him and learned the Qur'an from Ibn Mas'ud. Not all of them. Some went to Ubay, some went to Mu'adh, etc. The companions who learned from Ibn Mas'ud probably wrote down what they learned. So when Zayd asked the generality of the companions to bring their manuscripts to the masjid during the standardization process, those manuscripts were probably present. And I already said that the Uthmani textual tradition was a critical addition that assimilated the strongest readings from the existing companion textual traditions. In other words, much of the textual tradition of Ibn Mas'ud was incorporated into the Uthmani textual tradition. So the Codex Committee did take from Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Ka'ab and Salim and Mu'adh and others. The Codex Committee was in total conformity with this hadith. This hadith absolutely works against the Christian polemicists. Um, okay. Let's move on here. Ah, some Orientalists and many modern Christian polemicists claim that since there are reports that Ibn Mas'ud's codex did not contain Al-Fatiha, that Ibn Mas'ud did not consider Al-Fatiha a part of the Quran. So they're they're trying to they're trying their best here, right? So they introduce this shubha, uh, and for me this this goes beyond ridiculous. This is like ludicrous, right? Ludicrous is more strange anyway. If this report about his codex is accurate, it's obvious that Ibn Mas'ud did not write Al-Fatiha in his codex because Al-Fatiha was so ubiquitous. There was no need to write it down. And in fact, a scholar named Abu Bakr al-Anbari is quoted by Imam al-Qurtubi in Imam Qurtubi's tafsir. So according to Anbari, Ibn Mas'ud was asked point blank, why didn't you write Al-Fatiha in your Mus'haf? And Ibn Mas'ud responded, لو كتبتها لكتبتها مع كل سورة. That if I would have written it, I would have written it before every surah. Right? So this is how Muslims pray. We recite Al-Fatiha and then another surah. So Al-Anbari goes on to say that Ibn Mas'ud did not write it because there is no need. All of the Muslims had it memorized, and so he left it off for the sake of brevity. Okay, so the argument of the polemicist here is a non sequitur. A non sequitur. In other words, an argument that, that, whose conclusions does not follow. So Ibn Mas'ud did not write a surah down in his mushaf, therefore he denied that it was revelation. No, at this early time in history, orality took precedence over writing. Okay, and here's a quote from Dr. Nazir Khan. The reality is that the Sahaba used the writings for, of the Quran as memory aids for personal worship and recitation, and consequently never intended them as complete official copies of the Quran. And Imam al-Tabari, he actually, in his tafsir, of this ayah, 1587, that indeed we gave you the seven oft repeated verses and the great Quran. Imam Tabari, in his tafsir, he says that, like, what is the oft repeated 
oft-repeated one. What does that mean? He quotes a statement from Ibn Mas'ud, where he, Ibn Mas'ud said, Fatihatul al-kitab, al-fatiha. Wa Qur'an al-azim, qala sa'ilu al-Qur'an. Ibn Mas'ud is a statement attributed to him, a sound statement, that when the Qur'an says, sab'a min al-mathani, it's referring to al-fatiha. So how could he reject al-fatiha as being part of the Qur'an? Now, a, a critic here might say, well, those traditions could have been fabricated and to mitigate the controversy, and it just seems so convenient. Okay, but again, this is not a historical argument. It's an argument that a Christian apologist will use because he's forced to, because you know these traditions are devastating to his case. Uh, but fine, let's forget about these statements of Ibn Mas'ud. Let's use logic and common sense. If Ibn Mas'ud did not consider Al-Fatiha to be part of the Quran, then how did he pray? How did his students pray in Kufa? Like we know the names of his students, Al-Qama ibn Qais, Zir ibn Hubaysh. How did their students pray? We know their names, Ibrahim al-Nakha'i, Asim ibn Abi Najud. How did their students pray? Abu Hanifa. How did his students pray? Muhammad al-Shaybani. If Ibn Mas'ud did not believe in al-Fatiha, this causes a cascade of unsolved mysteries. <laughs> now in Bukhari, we're told that Ibn Mas'ud's student, Al-Qama, actually traveled to Syria and met with a companion named Abu Darda. And they talked about the textual tradition of Ibn Mas'ud. Did Al-Qama dispute with Abu Darda and his hundreds of students about the Quranic status of Al-Fatiha? No, he didn't. Uh, if he did, you better believe that we would have heard about that. This would have made headlines. Right? Okay. And the other question is, when, uh, when um, the Codex, when the Uthmani Codex came into Kufa with Al-Fatiha written on the first page, did the students of Ibn Mas'ud that were in Kufa say, that's not the Qur'an, and deny the Fatiha? Again, we would have heard about that. They would have been brought up on charges for blasphemy and put in prison or punished. There's nothing like this. Okay. Um, what's interesting also is um, Arthur Jeffrey, who was an Australian Orientalist, he points out that Ibn Abu Dawood mentions in his Kitab al-Musahif, that is reported that Ibn Mas'ud used to recite Al-Fatiha as Arshidna Sirat al-Mustaqim, Arshidna, instead of Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqim. And other critics are quick to point this out as well. So our critics, are, our, our scholars were very, very transparent. They mentioned all of these things. There's nothing to hide. But here's the problem for the critics. They can't have it both ways, right? So did Ibn Mas'ud believe in Al-Fatiha or not? Right? Is it, is it nothing or is it Arshidna? You can't have it both ways, right? Um, so I already mentioned that it is beyond obvious that Ibn Mas'ud considered Al-Fatiha to be a surah of the Qur'an. But what about this business of Arshidna? Was this an authentic variant reading, like Malik and Malik? Could it have, have been revealed to the Prophet in this way, in addition to Ihdina Surat al-Mustaqim, as a function of the Ahruf? The answer is yes, it's possible, although highly improbable, therefore not plausible. Right? Perhaps Ibn Mas'ud meant this, again, to be an explanatory note, a tafsiri note to himself that hidayah in this verse means irshad. Maybe that's possible, but it's anomalous, it's isolated, it has no solid basis. And our qira'at come from mass transmitted living traditions, not from isolated or spurious reports, and not from remote possibilities. Right? So the, the bottom line is no one denied al-Fatiha. This is just a smoke screen. The other thing they bring up to create another shubha is a report that states that Ibn Mas'ud's Mus'haf lacked the last two surahs of the Quran, the surah 113 and 114. It's called al Mu'awwadatain. Okay? Yeah, so Yuti mentions this. And therefore, here comes the, the wild non sequitur conclusion again. Ibn Mas'ud rejected these two surahs as being the Quran. And they cite some isolated reports where Ibn Mas'ud erased these surahs from his codex. So my response here has, is, has four parts. Number one, we have already established that for Ibn Mas'ud, um, if something was not written in his mushaf, it did not mean that he rejected it as being the Qur'an. Okay, perhaps he only wrote it in his mushaf, perhaps he only wrote in his mushaf what he heard the Prophet recite in prayer, so he didn't hear these two surahs recited in prayer, 
but that doesn't mean that he rejected them as the Quran. Of course, the Fatiha would be an exception here because it was so ubiquity, ubiquitous. Number two, our reading traditions come from mass transmission, not from isolated reports. Number three, according to Imam Shamsuddin al-Jazari in his famous book, four of the ten mass transmitted reading traditions, so we'll talk about these, Asim, Hamza, Al-Kisai, and Khalaf, all in Iraq, all of these can be traced uh, to the Prophet ﷺ through Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And all of them recite Surah 113 and 114. And number four, even if this were true, and this is a point that Ibn Hajar makes, even if this were true, and Ibn Mas'ud erased these two surahs from his Mus'haf because he didn't believe them to be the Quran, it's clear from his students and their students that he eventually did come to believe in their Quranic status. This is a point that Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani makes. So even if the statement is true, it's obvious that he changed his mind later. So this is yet another red herring that these polemicists want us to chase. This is making a mountain out of a molehill, basically. Okay, let's move to the Mus'haf of another companion, Ubay ibn Ka'b. So the polemicists, they also absolutely love this Mus'haf. Again, we don't actually have it, it's not extant. We only have writings that describe it. Any, any questions so far? So, okay, what's the big deal about this Mus'haf? Well, there are reports that the Mus'haf of Ibn Ka'b contained two additional surahs that did not make it into the Uthmani Codex. Okay. Um, so, first of all, Al-Alami mentions in his book, this book here, The History of the Quranic Text, that this report was first mentioned by someone named Hamad ibn Salama in 167 Hijrah, and that there's a major gap in the Isnad of this report of at least two or three generations. So, Al-Alami calls this report defective and spurious. Nonetheless, let's look at these so-called surahs. Okay. The first so-called surah was called Surah Al-Khala. And here it is. I'll read the entire surah. Allahumma inna nasta'inuka wa nastaghfiruka wa nu'minu bika wa natawakkulu alayka wa nudhi alayka al-khayra wa nashkuruka wa la nakfuruka wa nakhla'u wa natruku ma yafturuk. Oh Allah, we invoke you for help. Beg your forgiveness and we believe in you. And Trust in you and praise you the best way we can, and we thank you, and we are not ungrateful to you, and we forsake and turn away from the one who disobeys you. So that's it. This is supposed to be a surah. Not sure how many verses it is. The second so called surah is apparently called Surah Al Haft. Allahumma iyaka na'budu wa laknu salli wa nasjudu ilayka wa nasa'a wa nahfidu wa naju rahmatak wa naksha adabak in adabaka bil kufari mulhaq. Oh Allah, we worship you and prostrate ourselves before you, and we hasten towards you and serve you, and we hope. We receive your mercy and we dread your torment. Surely the disbelievers shall incur your torment. Okay. Now, if you're listening to this right now, especially if you're Hanafi, you must have immediately recognized what I just read is something called Dua al Qunut, right? It's also called al Qunut al Hanafiya. So, this is a very popular prophetic invocation. Okay, so, it's reported in numerous hadith. That the Prophet ﷺ would often recite the supplication, du'a al-qunut, during the audible prayers. Okay, and th these are just a few examples here of hadith that are graded as, as, as strong hadith. Like the first one says, An Ubay ibn Ka'b, on the authority of Ubay ibn Ka'b, the same Ubay ibn Ka'b who wrote the codex in question. So the Messenger of God used to pray witr and recite al-qunut before bowing. The second hadith in Sunan al Nasai, on the authority of Ubay ibn Ka'b, the Messenger of God, used to pray three cycles during Salat al Witr, and he would recite in the first, Surah 87, and the second, Surah 109, and the third, Surah 112, and then Al Qunut before bowing. And then the Hadith in Tirmidhi from Bara ibn Azib, the Prophet used to recite Al Qunut in the morning and sunset prayer. So this was something the Sahaba heard the Prophet say in prayer. Right? Now, Dr. Sean Anthony, who's um, a professor at The Ohio State University, who's kind of, you know, an uh, up-and-coming academic, secular scholar of the Quran. He's not hostile. He's not a polemicist. But he's written on this topic 
of the alleged two lost surahs. And he concludes, this is a quote from him, a horde of evidence strongly indicates that not merely Ubay ibn Ka'b, but also other companions regarded the surahs, he means these two surahs, as part of the Qur'an and therefore part of the prophetic revelation given to Muhammad Now, I don't necessarily disagree with him here. I think it's certainly understandable why some companions could have thought that these were surahs. So the Prophet used to recite them in prayer. Okay, this is no doubt why Ubay ibn Ka'b and, may, and maybe others wrote these supplications down in their mushafs because the Prophet would recite them in prayer. But then Anthony says this, he says that these surahs, quote, for whatever reason came to be excluded from the canon by the process of Uthman's collection and textual canonization of the prophetic revelation. For whatever reason, so I think the reason is, is more than obvious that these so-called surahs were not deemed genuine surahs by the Codex Committee because the vast majority of the companions always knew them to be special supplications that the Prophet would recite in prayer nonetheless, but not as Quranic surahs. And the companions who did regard them as surahs were simply wrong. They were under a misapprehension. So again, the Uthmani textual tradition was the most widely recited rendition of the prophetic archetype because it was culled from the most widely attested reading of the companions. So why else would the committee exclude them, right? Why would they exclude these so-called surahs if they're surahs? Do they contain some, you know, aberrant or, you know, blasphemous teaching? No. Do they contain some, you know, embarrassing grammatical errors? No. Do their meanings contradict the rest of the Quran in some way? No. Okay, so this is, this is enough. But for what it's worth, let's look at the internal evidence of these so-called surahs. Okay. Um, so there's a, there's a scholar, Dr. Van Putin, uh, Marain Van Putin, who says that, no, I think they sound like the Qur'an, and I think they're surahs of the Qur'an. So I, I disagree with him. I actually don't think that they sound like the Qur'an. Uh, I think the style and diction of these so-called surahs contravene the Qur'anic idiom. And the reason is because they are the words of the Prophet wasallam. So what I mean is, they're in correct Arabic, the meanings are sound, and they uh, agree with the theology and message of the Qur'an, but stylistically, they are not Qur'anic. Okay? So, um, and I'll give you just two pieces of internal evidence of that. So, like, the, both of these so-called surahs begin with Allahumma, right? Meaning, O oh God. But Allahumma never appears in the Qur'an as the first word of any verse, as it does in these so-called surahs. In every occurrence in the Qur'an, Allahumma is preceded by either Qul, Qala, or something equivalent, like Da'wahum fiha, Subhanak Allahumma. Their cry therein will be, in other words, God is quoting the people of paradise. So this is equivalent to saying Qalu, Subhanak Allahumma. Right? So it's, it's contrary to, the, to the, uh, the diction of the Qur'an. And then number two here, and even Anthony calls this one compelling evidence, in so-called Surah Al-Khala, it says, "Wala nakfuruka," right? We don't disbelieve in you. So if we go back here, you see that um, uh, towards the end, right? "Wala nakfuruka," nakfuruka, right? With with the verb nakfuru, uh, and then there's a second person masculine singular pronominal suffix as a direct object, ka, nakfuru ka. However, in the idiom of the Qur'an, we should have expected to see nakfuru bika. The Qur'an always uses the preposition bi before the object of the verb kafara, yakfuru. In other words, this verb always takes an indirect object. And at the bottom of the slide, those are just a few examples. Kayfa takfuruna billah, waladina kafuru wakadabu bi-ayatillah. فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ مَا عَرَفُوا كَفَرُوا بِهِ وَمَا يَكْفُرُوا بِهَا إِلَى الْفَاسِقْ So the hundreds of examples like this, and every single time this happens. So no, this is Dua Al-Qunut. It is the inspired speech of the Prophet It is not the verbatim or talaqi, revealed speech of God. Okay, if Sean Anthony's contention is correct, and some of the companions believe these words to be Qur'anic suwar, then the Codex Committee corrected their misunderstanding. Again, the, the solution is very simple. Okay. So here, I just make a point here, I'll just go over this quickly, 
that I talk about the guilt complex of some of the Christian polemicists. So you should be aware of this, I think. This is a bit psychological. So I'm, I'm going to just re go over this quickly, just kind of review it. That according to the Quran, this is in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that there are some Ahlul Kitab whose desire is to make you kuffar because the truth of Islam has been manifest to them and they have envy. Right? So it's called the guilt complex. In other words, I mean, if you take a class on higher biblical criticism in the academy, they completely rip the Bible to shreds. And they actually have now like exit counseling because you have people that go, like Christians who are very devout, they go to the seminary and, um, you know, they take these classes on the Pentateuch and the four gospels and the source criticism, redaction criticism, and because they want to get their, you know, their, their, their div, uh, masters of divinity or something, their MDiv. And then they end up losing faith. This happens a lot. So they have to have this like, exit counseling. Like, so a lot of them, they become uh, very bitter, right? And turn on the Quran suddenly. So they have this attitude of, well, if my book is going down in flames, I'm taking your book down with it, right? So they want us to sort of commiserate with them. And this is why a lot of these Christian apologists are probing into sort of the pre uthmanic Quran and the companion codices and drawing these wild conclusions by looking at these reports in, in, in our traditional literature. Anyway, uh, so I think I'll just um, skip past this part. But basically what they want to do is they're looking for some sort of like holy grail when it comes to Quranic manuscripts. You know, like in, 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 in New Testament manuscripts, like they discovered that 1 John 5, 7, I mentioned earlier, the only verse that, is, that describes the Trinity is not found in the best Greek manuscripts. That's what they're looking for in our manuscripts. They're looking for an extra surah somewhere. There's a surah, you know, um, that's, you know, clearly a surah, not a dua, right? <laughs> like clearly a bismillah, and there's like, you know, ayat, it's, it's clearly a surah that, oh, it's not in the Uthmani Codex, right? Or there's, a, there's a, a version of a verse that is completely different, the wording is different, and the, the theology is different, something like that, right? Because this is what happened to their own text. This is what's happening to their own text, right? So this is why they're also obsessed with the Sun'a palimpsest that we'll talk about, the, the manuscript found in Sun'a. And you'll see how they, uh, how they treat that manuscript. Okay, so anyway, we'll skip over that. Now, what is the Uthmani textual tradition? So we can break this down a little bit more. What is this? So the Uthmani textual tradition is the Quran we recite today. What is it? It is a collection of the dominant readings of the Quran by the Sahaba in Medina in 650 of the Common Era. Exactly, yeah, at the latest. And the committee, who, who was on the committee? Sahaba, eyewitnesses, ear witnesses to the Prophet ﷺ. Hufad of the Quran, you know, Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet ﷺ. Zayd was the neighbor of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? So eyewitnesses. So when, when Uthman commissioned Zayd as director, Zayd commanded that all Sahaba who had any personal Quranic manuscripts, right, companion codices in their homes, to bring them to the masjid. Okay. Again, we know that the Prophet ﷺ had appointed scribes. These are called Kutab al-Wahi. And according to Muslim sources, for every portion of the Quran presented, Zay demanded two witnesses. What does two witnesses mean? So Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, he says, Al-Murad anna huma yashhadani, yashhadani ala an thalik al-maktub kataba bain yaday Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani says, two witnesses who testified that the verse, or literally that which was written, was written verbatim in the very presence of the Prophet. In other words, the two men who saw it written in the very presence of the Prophet So Al-Azami clarifies, two men who saw it written under the Prophet's supervision, two of the official scribes, really. And this was based on the verse in the Quran that says that whenever we enter into a contract, let two witnesses from your men bear witness, right? So these men must witness the actual writing of the contract. So we can imagine then 
uh, that there were many, many manuscripts submitted by different companions that contained the same verses, right? So a lot of duplicates. We can also imagine that due to the Quran being revealed in seven Ahruf, that there were some variations of the same verses in the manuscripts of different companions. So two witnesses does not mean that only two men were reciting those verses, or that only two men remember hearing the Prophet recite those verses. It meant that two men distinctly remember when those verses were ordered by the Prophet himself to be transcribed. Okay? Those verses could have been recited by thousands of companions, hundreds of whom heard the Prophet recite them. So why did Uthman choose Zayd to head the committee? The answer is, in addition to, to Zayd being the, the Prophet's close companion and his neighbor, Zayd was also the chief scribe of the Prophet and he was also a hafiz of the Qur'an, and all men serving on the Codex Committee were hafaz. So whenever a manuscript was witnessed for by two men, okay, the committee then checked it against other manuscripts, and then against their memories and the memories of the well-known hafaz of the Qur'an. And those readings that were deemed to be the most widely recited among the hafaz, right, the Qur'an masters among the companions, as well as among the generality of the other companions, those readings were officially transcribed in the Master Uthmani Codex. So written and recited materials were collated against each other to determine the most dominant readings. Now, now why did Zayd do all of this? Why the two witnesses? Why not just write down what the committee was reciting? Why look at the manuscripts? And the answer is, Zayd and the committee wanted to reconcile the written Qur'an with the recited Qur'an. They wanted to make doubly sure that nothing was left unaccounted for. Okay, So perhaps there were verses written down uh, that were not being recited. If so, why? Perhaps there were you know, verses being recited that were not written down. If so, why? He wanted to, make, he wanted to ensure total agreement and accuracy. Okay? So Zayd said, I gathered the Quran from various manuscripts and from the memories of men. So let's say, for instance, for instance, that a, that a manuscript or two was presented that contained the Dua al-Qunut, you know, the two so-called surahs that were found in the Mus'haf of Ubay ibn Ka'b, at least as it's reported. Why were these verses not transcribed in the Master Codex by the committee? Were they somehow theologically offensive? No, we already covered that. Perhaps these verses lacked a single witness among the scribes. In other words, they could not verify that the Prophet ﷺ himself considered these verses to be the Qur'an. That perhaps these verses were not widely recited as surahs of the Qur'an. In the end, the committee demanded or deemed that these verses constituted a prophetic supplication, not Qur'anic ayat. And that the companions who considered them to be surahs were simply wrong. So the committee did their due diligence. They really could not have done a better job. Now, according to Muslim sources, the last two verses of Surah at tawbah had only one witness, okay, Abu Khuzayma al-Ansari. Again, this did not mean that only one man was reciting those verses, or that only one man heard the Prophet recite those verses. It meant that only one man remembered when these verses were transcribed by order of the Prophet So Zayd and the committee, they went down and wrote these two verses in the Master Codex, despite having only one witness, precisely because these verses were so widely recited amongst many, many Sahaba, and there really was no doubt about them. So it appeared that the rule of two was important to the committee, but it was still secondary to what the committee regarded as being widely recited or mass transmitted in recitation. So that's important. For the companions, the earliest Muslims, the written word was important, but it took a backseat to what was widespread in recitation. Okay. Um, so coming down the uh, rounding third base here, coming down home stretch, inshallah. So, uh, coming to the end. Uh, now, um, many modern anti Muslim polemicists, they, like I said, they enjoy sort of raising doubts and suspicions about the actions of the Codex Committee under Uthman, right? And their claim is basically that the Uthmani textual tradition, um, you know, the Qur'an we recite today is not what the Prophet used to recite, that the Uthmani text is somehow incorrect or corrupted, right? And they'll appeal to two things to support their position. 
So, number one, they will appeal to some of the radical claims of the extreme elements of the leaders of the Rafida, right, the, the Shia, who claim that Uthman's committee corrupted the Quran. And number two, they will appeal to the fact that many of the readings of the Quran recorded in the various companion codices differed from the standard Uthmani codex. So let's look at the first uh, so-called piece of evidence. Now, it is true that there have been a few Shiite scholars, okay, who have claimed that Uthman's committee manipulated at least a couple of verses that praise the Ahl al-Bayt, right, the Prophet's family. Um, in other words, the committee did what the Quran says that certain Jewish scribes did to the Hebrew Bible. The Quran says, يُحَرِّفُونَ الْكَلِمَ عَمْ مَوَادِعِ which literally means they, they shifted words out of their proper context. So they decontextualized the text, which is a form of textual corruption. And the Shiites actually identify these verses as uh, what they call Ayatul Ghadir and Ayatul Tathir, uh, which appear in surahs 5 and 33 of the Uthmanic Quran, respectively. So their claim is that there are statements in these verses which really belong in other surahs, right? And that by placing them in the present surahs, 5 and 33, the committee altered their true context and their true meanings. So when these, you know, anti-Muslim atheists or Christian polemicists, they hear stuff like this, they jump all over it, right? It's music to their ears. They say, ah, you see, even other Muslims are saying that Uthman's uh, codex is corrupted and unreliable, and so on and so forth. And you know, Wandsboro, he pointed out that Muslims went from an interfaith accusation of scriptural alteration to an intrafaith accusation of scriptural alteration. So basically, here's my twofold response to this. Uh, number one, the vast majority of Shia do not make this claim. Okay, the vast, vast majority. This claim actually clashes with, with clear-cut texts within the Quran. Surah Al-Hijr, ayah number nine, inna nahnu wa inna lahu lahafidhun. We have revealed the dhikr and we will, I mean the Quran, and we will preserve it. I mean, one would have to interpret this verse in very strange and very cryptic ways in order to maintain one's claim that the Quran has been corrupted. So based upon the very clear and apparent meaning of this verse, the Quran is preserved. And to say otherwise is zandaka, is, is heresy. So this is really a fringe opinion among a few Shiite exegetes, okay, that the overwhelming majority do not endorse. So that, that's important to mention. That's the first uh, part of my response. The second part is that, this, that historically and logically, this, this claim like completely implodes into oblivion. Let me show you why you think about this. If the, if the Codex Committee of Uthman manipulated or changed or corrupted verses of the Quran that praised Ahl al-Bayt, then surely this would have run afoul of Sayyidina Ali, right? Uh, so was Sayyidina Ali secretly reciting some uncorrupted form of these verses uh, in his home with Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein? So if, if certain Shiites should answer this question with a yes, then when Ali became caliph and moved to the, Kuf, the, the capital of the Kufa, why didn't he call for another codex committee right, to, to, quote, correct the Mus'haf? He could have done that. He was Khalifa al muslimin He was Amir al-Mu'minin. You know, why didn't he form a second committee to restore you know, these verses and correct the Uthmani Codex? But what did Ali actually do? He actually led the prayers in Kufa every day by reciting the Uthmani textual tradition. You know? So he recited exactly what was presented to the Kufans five years earlier by Abdul Rahman al-Sulami, who actually brought the Uthmani Codex into Kufa. Um, so, so the claim that the committee corrupted the Quran because they wanted to like, disparage or delegitimize the family of the Prophet is, is absolute garbage. It's total garbage. Okay. And again, I think the, the, the few Shiite leaders that make this claim, you know, there's something else happening with them. There's something, there's something else happening. Um, now, the second piece of evidence that these anti-Muslim polemicists will use in order to throw suspicion upon the Codex Committee is the fact that some of the readings in the companion codices differed from the Uthmani Codex. And we talked about this. We talked about Ibn Mas'ud. We talked about Ubay ibn Ka'b. But now let's talk about the Sun'a palimpsest. Okay, so this is sort of the, the, the final part of this presentation. This is the, um, 
uh, what, this is something we really have to uh, be aware of, okay? This is the only manuscript ever found of the Quran that is def different in its textual tradition than the Uthmani Codex. Okay, so we talked about Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Ka'b. Now, the lower text of the Yemeni palimpsest is another example. What do I mean by lower text? Okay, so in 1972, the Grand Mosque in Sana'a in Yemen was being renovated. And up in the roof, they found this huge mushaf. And they brought it down, and it's about 41% of the Quran. And they read it, and it's the Uthmani Codex. It's, it's just the Uthmani Codex. And then they brought in scholars from Europe, German scholars, and they took it back and they analyzed it, and they noticed that there's actually an undertext, right? So the word palimpsest, this is a technical term. Palimpsest means an ancient sort of whiteboard, right? So, so um, like a, to make a codex, a codex is a book, like a kitab, right? Of, of parchment, of leather. To make one Quran, one mushaf, you have to slaughter 300 animals for one book, 300 animals. So you can see how expensive it is to make one book. So what you, what you can actually do with a parchment is you can erase it and write over it. And when that happens, the name of this text, this mushaf, is called a palimpsest, an ancient sort of whiteboard. Okay? So when they took it back to the, wherever they took it back, they noticed under sort of ultraviolet light that there's an undertext. Okay? And that this undertext is slightly different than the Uthmani textual tradition that was written over it. Okay? No. Yeah. They were, yeah. It, yeah, because it's just very expensive. You know, they reuse things. You might have one artist who had like three canvases his whole life and he's just painting over them. You know, so they would definitely do this with manuscripts. Okay. Now, according to the most authoritative academic study done on the palimpsest, so this was by two scholars named Sadiri and Gudarzi. I think one's Stanford and one was at Harvard. The lower text of the Yemeni palimpsest was most likely a companion codex. It was a codex that belonged to a Sahabi. So Sadiri calls it C1, right? The, the codex of an unknown companion. Let me see. Um, yes, here it is. Okay, so it is the only manuscript, as I mentioned, the only manuscript of the Quran ever discovered that is not part of the Uthmani textual tradition or Uthmani textual stemma or family. So C1 is, um, as I said, 41% of the Quran. It's most likely written between 617 and 647, obviously before the Codex Committee, like right before the Codex Committee. Now, I've already explained why there are some differences among the companion textual traditions. Uh, according to our tr traditional sources. So remember we said there's four reasons why. S different spelling conventions. Number two, variance due to the revealed ahruf, where the rasim is slightly different. Number three, possible scribal errors. Number four, possible exegetical glosses or notes made by the companions. So the lower text of C1 is no different. So just as our tradition perfectly explains the variance in the textual traditions of Ibn Mas'ud, in Ubay ibn Ka'b, it also perfectly explains the variants in the textual tradition of C1. So at the end of the day, C1 is, you know, what one of my colleagues referred to as a big and nothing burger. That it's um, that the discovery of C1 actually supports the Muslim narrative. So so anti-Muslim polemicists they wanted something so bad they wanted to find some additional verses, additional surahs, or highly theologically significant material in C1 when compared to the Uthmani textual tradition, and there, there was really nothing significant. Okay, so let's look at some of the differences here. Okay, so there, there's a, by the way, there's a really nice short video on YouTube that explains basically all of the differences. It's like 15 minutes long. It's called, What Do the Sana Manuscripts Tell Us About the Quran? It's by al Muqaddimah. Just put al muqaddima and then Sana'a Manuscript or something, and it should come up. It's a very good video. I'll, I'll just summarize the major findings here. Okay, there are, there are 35 
minor textual differences between C1 and the Uthmani text, um, where instead of like a wa, it says fa, instead of a lan, it says la, or a definite article is missing from a word like that. These are differences in like prepositions, particles, and definite articles. There are also another 25 or so differences in nouns and verbs. Like 18 of the 25 are with similar sounding words. So these are very easily explained away as human error. Like sometimes a word in C1 is missing when compared to Uthman. This is again likely human error. So people are much more likely to leave a word out when writing from memory than, than add a word. There are a few instances, however, where C1 has an extra word when compared to Uthman. But even these can be explained away as textual assimilation, which is another form of human error. So for example, in the Uthmani tradition, Surah Al-Baqarah verse 193 says, C1 says, kulluhu lillah. So C1 has this extra word, kulluhu. So you say, where did C1 get this word from? Well, it's very likely that the scribe confused 2193 with 839. Because in Surah Al-Anfal, verse 39, we do have, وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ كُلُّهُ لِلَّهِ This is called textual assimilation of parallel verses. This is very common. And if you ever memorize Quran, you probably do this all the time, that you confuse in your mind similar sounding verses. Because many of the ayat, they're very similar. There might be a slight difference. So you think, well, is it, is it this one or is it that one? That's, that's very clearly what's happening here. Yeah. So almost all of these additions in C1 can be explained by textual assimilation of parallel verses. There are more instances where the Uthmani text has additional words that are not in C1. And according to Sadri and Bergman, they have a paper they wrote on this called The Codex of a Companion of the Prophet and the Quran of the Prophet, they say this means that the Uthmani tradition is closer to the prophetic archetype than C1 or Ibn Mas'ud. Okay. Now, from our perspective as Muslims, we have sort of no problem saying that it is possible that many of these differences between C1 and the Uthmani Codex are due to the revealed seven Ahruf. In other words, it's possible that Al-Baqarah 193 was also revealed as kulluhu lillah, that the Uthmani committee stabilized the Rasam based upon the most prevalent reading. Uh, but with this verse specifically, it just seems like a scribal error. You know, so, so here's the conclusion of Behnam Sadiqi and, and Yui Bergman about the Yemeni palimpsest. This is, this, again, the most rigorous academic study ever done on secular study on, on the Yemeni palimpsest. This is their conclusion. In any case, textual criticism suggests the standard version, what do they mean by standard version? The Uthmani textual tradition, the standard version is the most faithful representation among the known codices of the Quran as recited by the Prophet. This appears at first as a curious coincidence, but on second thought, not surprising. If anyone had the resources to ensure that a reliable version be chosen, it would have been the Caliph. And if anyone had more to lose by botching up the task, again, it would have been Uthman whose political legitimacy and efficacy as caliph depended completely on the goodwill of fellow distinguished associates of the prophet. The remarkable few and minor skeletal morphemic differences among the codices, Uthman sent to the cities, is another indication of the care that was put into the process of standardization. And I'll talk about those, quote, minor skeletal morphemic differences. But that's the Yemeni palimpsest. Any questions on the Yemeni palimpsest? It's just, you know, it's, it's everything can be explained away uh, through our tradition. There's nothing new, there's nothing mysterious, nothing dramatic. Okay. Okay, so let's see here. Yeah, we're coming, coming down to the end, inshallah. I want to talk a little bit here about, let's see. Yeah. Okay, so there's a little bit left here. <laughs> but I want to talk about the canonical reading traditions. It's the next topic that's really, really important. So how do we go from the Uthmani Masahif to the 10 authorized Qira'at? In other words, how do we go from the Uthmani textual tradition to the canonical reading traditions? What are the canonical reading traditions? Like Hafs and Asim and so on and so forth. Warsh. 
okay? Perhaps an asr, and a nafir, and so on and so forth. So, so the Caliph Uthman, radiallahu anhu, he sent out four or five or seven, up to 11 copies of the Medinan Master Codex to these major Muslim cities. There are various reports. According to Suyuti, the most popular report states that Uthman made five copies of the Master Codex. He made five copies. That's the most popular report. And he sent them to Mecca, Basra, Kufa, Damascus, and then another one in Medina. Okay? But remember, we said these codices are not voweled. Right? The diacritical system had not even been invented yet. Right? Abu Aswad ad duali would develop an early form of it a bit later. So these, uh, these codices were unvoweled. They were also dotless. There were no dots. And dots were used by the Arabs at that time. So why didn't Uthman dot his codices? Well, the answer, answer again is very simple. By leaving the rusum, right, the consonantal skeletons of these, of these codices undotted, Uthman allowed for the ahruf to be accommodated by the reciters. Right? So reciters in these amsar, these major cities, these regional areas, could plug into the text the divinely revealed ahruf, the, the recitational variances given to the Prophet ﷺ. And definitively dotting the text would have severely limited their abilities to do this. So again, the text of the Quran had always been multiformic, not uniformic, since the time of the Prophet. ﷺ. And so Uthman wanted that key aspect of the Quran to be transmitted to the next generation. Does that make sense? Why he chose not to dot anything? There's no vowels, so right? But why didn't he dot them? Because it would have, it would have limited right, the ahruf. Now, I said earlier that Uthman's committee stabilized the text once and for all, and this is true. But how would all of the ahruf in their totality be accommodated okay, by the Uthmani codices? Okay, hence the Uthmani textual tradition. So the, the most coherent answer is that they were not all accommodated in their totality. So it is not the opinion of our classical scholars that the totality of the ahruf must be preserved and recited in order for the Quran to be preserved. Okay? As long as at least one harf is presented of any given verse, then the Qur'an is preserved. Now, this is Imam al-Jazari, Ibn, Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, etc. Not all of the ahruf in their totality are contained within the Uthmani textual tradition. This is not necessary. Okay, so as we said earlier, we said maybe Suf al-Manfush, Suf would have been revealed, but we're not reciting it. We don't need to recite it. Because we have one harf of that ayah, and that's sufficient. Okay. So remember, the, the ahruf were given as a concession, a ruksa, and so one may uh, abandon a concession. As we said, this is why, for example, all of the Uthmani codices read ihin in Surah 101, verse 5, but takuna jibaluk al ihni al manfush, and not suf al manfush. If suf was revealed as a harf, it did not need to be accommodated. And having, again, rusum that were at odds would have caused more turmoil in the provinces. We talked about that. So the committee chose Ihnil Manfush because that was a more popular reading. And so that's what they wrote in all of the regional codices. Okay. But here's another question. Oh, sorry. But even with this said, Uthman did allow for a slight variance in the rusum of his codices when it came to some particular variation. So prepositions, particles, but not words or phrases. So according to uh, Abu Urbaid, Uthman's six codices were in 99.999% agreement in the rusum. Okay, there was a difference of 43 characters out of almost 374,000 characters. And this was intentional. So the committee did accommodate for a few of the well-attested particular variations that very slightly altered the rusum. For example, in the Meccan Codex, there's an additional preposition min in verse 100 of Surah At-Tawbah. Okay, so that does not appear in the other codices. So that's two characters, mim and nun. And there are a few more like this, totaling 43 characters across six codices. So again, these were intentional. They were accommodating various authorized readings. But the other question is, how did the reciters living in these regional uh, cities how did they know how to plug the ahruf into the rasam? Right? How did they know how to read an unvoweled, undotted text? How did they know how to read it? Was it just guesswork? 
saying, well, they were, they were Arabs and they knew, that, that doesn't cut it. That means nothing. Right? If you give a newspaper that's unvowel to an average Arab, he's going to struggle a bit trying to read it. And those are words that he's very familiar with. So classical Orientalists like, you know, Gold Zahir and Arthur Jeffrey, they used to claim that indeed reciters were at total liberty to vowel and dot the text however they wanted. Right? As long as the text sort of made sense to them, it was all good. Right? And this is why there are different reading traditions, or this is why the different reading traditions eventually developed according to the Orientalists. And today some neo-Orientalists and Christian polemicists will say this. So this is demonstrably false, and I'll show you why, inshallah. Um, do my clicker on. Okay, so, but first, how, what else do our sources say about what Uthman did? So Uthman, mashallah, he did an incredible service for this religion. Uh, he did not simply send these codices to these cities without guidance. So he sent, with each codex, a master qari who was trained, a trained reciter of the Qur'an, who was either a companion of the Prophet or a student of a companion, who had mastered how to read his respective codex upon all of its possible and authentically transmitted ahruf. So for example, he sent Al-Mughira ibn Shihab to Syria with the Damascene Codex. He sent Abdurrahman al-Sulami to Kufa with the Kufan Codex. So it was these uh, committee-appointed Qurra who taught the regional reciters, the regional Qurra, how to read the codices. And I'll demonstrate this in a minute. Okay, but Imam Suyuti quoted Zaid ibn Thabit who said, al qiraa sunnah, very important. al qiraa sunnah, recitation is sunnah, i.e. it is from the Prophet So all of this was talaqi. The recitation of the Quran was passed down verbatim, from teacher to student, teacher to student, until it reached us. So how does this work? So imagine that Abdurrahman al-Sulami arrives in Kufa with his codex. Ibn Mas'ud's textual tradition was already popular in Kufa, right, when al-Sulami arrived. However, many of the readings of Ibn Mas'ud were either abrogated by the Prophet during his final Mu'arada with Gabriel, or they were abandoned by the committee because they were not strongly backed by the majority of the companions in Medina, and Uthman wanted to stabilize the text. However, by and large, the Uthmani textual tradition and the textual tradition of Ibn Mas'ud were in total agreement. In fact, as we said, the Uthmani textual tradition was based upon the strongest readings of the companions including many of the readings of Ibn Mas'ud. So this is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is mentioned in the Isnad of Hafs and Asim, along with other Sahaba. So the Isnad begins with the Prophet ﷺ, then Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and Ubay ibn Ka'ab, and Zayd ibn Thabit, and others, but these are the most eminent. And Abdur then Abdurrahman al-Sulami, he was the master Qari, who brought the Kufan Codex to Kufa. Then his pro most prominent student, Asim, and then his most prominent students, one of his most prominent students, Hafs ibn Sulaiman. So how did Asim vowel and dot his regional codex? Asim, when he, when he was reading the Quran, learning the Quran, how did he dot and vowel it? Um, did he have absolute free reign to vowel and dot whatever he wanted? as long as the text made sense, or did he have no choice whatsoever? So the answer is in the middle, he had something called ikhtiyar al-qari. So he had, the, he had a choice. He had the ability to choose, but only from among a fixed number of variants that all had origin in the prophetic archetype. In other words, variants that were taught to him by his teacher, right? Abdurrahman al-Sulami, who mastered the Uthmani textual tradition with all of its various ahruf. So these are variants that have strong and connected chains of transmission. Okay, so, so the regional reciters were obligated to fulfill three conditions okay, when they chose their readings. In order for their readings to be correct and authorized, they must fulfill three conditions. Number one, their readings must be in agreement with the rasam of at least one Uthmani codex. Number two, their readings must be mass transmitted, that is transmitted through generations after generations of reciters with uninterrupted chains of transmission tracing back to the Prophet ﷺ. And number three, which is more secondary, their readings must be in correct Arabic. And I say secondary because there's nothing mass transmitted that agrees with the Uthmani textual tradition that is not in, 
that is in incorrect Arabic. Everything's in correct Arabic. Of course, there's some modern, uh, you know, um, sort of polemicists or critics of the Quran that will point out certain things in the Quran and say, this is a grammatical error, but none of these things are actually true. And we can look into that uh, in the next seminar, inshallah. Now, in the 4th century Hijri, an Iraqi scholar named Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid, okay, this is very important, he wrote a famous book called Kitab al-Sab'ah, the Qara'at. He died in 936 of the Common Era. Now, during his time, there were many, many correct reading traditions, different Qara'at within the Uthmani textual tradition. Dozens of Qara'at had risen to prominence over the last couple of centuries. So Ibn Mujahid, he chose seven of these popular reading traditions that he documented in his book, Kitab al-Sab'ah. And these were Ibn Amr, Abu Amr, Ibn Kathir, Nafi, Hamza, Al-Kisai, and Asim. Okay? So two points here. Number one, these reading traditions were already very popular even before Ibn Mujahid was born. Okay, so this fact is mentioned explicitly by a Suyuti in his Itqan. This is why Ibn Mujahid chose them. Uh, his choosing of them probably made them more popular, but they were already very popular. And Abu Ubaid ibn Salam made mention of them uh, before Ibn Mujahid. Suyuti said that by the end of the second century, people were upon the readings of Abu Amr, Hamza, Asim, Ibn uh, Amr, Ibn Kathir, and Nafir. So that's one point. The second point is that each one of these eponymous Qurra, highlighted by Ibn Mujahid, had a multitude of students who had been transmitting the Qur'an from them. Okay, so these were huge, vibrant reading traditions. So one of these eponymous Qurra, Ibn Amr, right? Qari Ibn Amr, um, he learned the Qur'an under the Sahabi Abu Darda. This is according to Ibn Asakir in Tariq al-Dimashq. Okay? And Ibn Amr learned the Qur'an from Abu Darda, who had 1,600 students. So Ibn Amr was one of the 1,600 students of a companion named Abu Darda. One companion had 1,600 students. So now imagine how many total students from the Tabi'een there were from all the Sahaba who transmitted and taught the Qur'an. So if, even if 10% of the Sahaba we're transmitting the Qur'an, that's 10,000 Sahaba. If each one just had 50 students, that's half a million students in the second generation. In reality, the numbers are in the millions. But this is what Tawatur means. This is called mass transmission. Okay. Now, this is very important to understand. Over time, many people erroneously conflated the seven reading traditions, the Qira'at, in Ibn Mujahid's book with the seven ahruf, because it's the same number. Okay, and so many people started to say that there are only seven correct reading traditions. Because the Prophet said that the Quran was revealed upon seven ahruf. So this of course was a major misunderstanding. So this is very important. The Qira'at and the Ahruf are not the same things. But they started to say that Asim is one harf, and Nafi is one harf, and Ibn Amr is one harf. No. Asim and Nafi and Ibn Amr are qira'at that drew from the pool of the seven ahruf. So that's very important. Okay, so if you go into, for example, uh, Hafs and Asim in that qira'a, you'll find all seven qira'at in that one, all seven ahruf, sorry. You'll find examples of all seven ahruf in this one qira'a. So these are not the same thing. Um, uh huh? Yeah, 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 yes, exactly. All seven. So, so there's, so there's actually ten. So we'll continue here. I'll, I'll get there, inshallah. So then, Abu Amr al Dani, right? Uh, um, a, a, a few generations after Ibn Mujahid, um, what he did was he chose two popular students from each of the seven eponymous Qurra and documented their readings. So the so. Um, these are called the two rawis, or the canonical transmitters. So, okay, so in Kufa, the reading tradition of Asim became popular. Okay, we mentioned that. But how did it become popular? It became popular through his two top students. One was Shu'ba and one was Hafs. Okay, so the reading traditions of Shu'ba and Hafs were documented by Adani and eventually standardized with voweling and dotting. So this really makes 14 canonical and authorized reading traditions. The seven eponymous Qurra through their respective two rawis, right? So seven times two is 14. 
Um, and then about four centuries after Ibn Mujahid, a scholar named uh, Shem, Imam Shamsuddin al-Jazari, whom Suyuti considered to be the greatest scholar ever in the field of Qara'a, he wrote a masterpiece called Kitab al-Nashr fi Qara'at al-Ashr. He died 1429. And so Ibn Jazari, he said that in fact, the reading traditions of Ya'qub al-Basri, Abu Ja'far al-Madani, and Khalif al-Baghdadi were also transmitted, uh, um, were also uh, correct and mass transmitted and multiply attested. And so there are now 20 canonical reading traditions. So 10 eponymous Qurra through their respective two Rawis. Okay. So today about 95% of the Sunni world reads Hafs and Asim. That's the reading tradition of Qari Asim through his Rawi Hafs. 3% read Warsh and Nafir. And the remaining 2% are divided between Qalun and Nafir, and probably Ibn Dhaqwan, Ibn Abi, uh, and Ibn Amr, and maybe Ad-Duri and Abi Amr. So really only five are recited. The other 15 are studied and memorized and known by Quran masters, but they're not so much recited anymore in like public congregational prayers. Um, there's a good website called nquran.com, the letter n, quran.com. It's in Arabic, but uh, you, can, you can actually go on the site and it shows you how all 20 transmitters of the 10 reading traditions read every single verse of the Quran. Okay, um, I think I'm gonna, yeah, okay. Yeah, so an another, I'm, I'm gonna sort of skip around here. I'm gonna mention one more potential shubha that's mentioned by hmm, Western academics. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, so, so here's something that these polemicists point out. Okay. It, it's the fact that some traditional Muslim scholars, they criticize Hafs with respect to his knowledge of hadith. So like 95% of the Muslim Ummah, they recite the Quran according to who? Hafs and Asim. But there's also reports in our traditions that Hafs was weak in hadith. Okay. Uh, that he's rejected in hadith. So they say, see, well, you're reciting from someone who's weak in hadith. So the answer here is very basic. Hadith was not his tachassus, was not his specialty, okay? Many of the best Qur'an today, the best in the world, are not necessarily masters or scholars of hadith, okay? So they're masters, they're a'imma of the Qur'an. That's their focus, and the focus of Hafs ibn Sulaiman, right? Hafs an Asim was on the uh, Qur'an. That's number one. He was an absolute master of the Qur'an. Number two, the hadith scholars who actually criticized his knowledge of hadith praised him in his transmission and recitation of the Quran. Right? So these are two separate disciplines. This is not, there, there is not a single example of a traditional Sunni scholar quoting a Qur'a, Imam Hafs, and then claiming that it's fabricated or somehow uh, falsified. So, so these polemicists are here really clutching at straws. Another thing they'll mention, we're co really coming on to the, the end here actually, um, a a popular claim of modern polemicists is that Ibn Mujahid, okay, using the apparatus of the Abbasid government, he used to prosecute anyone who read outside of his chosen seven traditions. Okay, so this is a bit misleading. So let me say two things about this. It's true that the state authorities did prosecute certain Qurra, okay, but only really two types of Qurra. The first type would deviate from the Uthmani textual tradition and would publicly recite according to the textual traditions of individual companions, such as Ibn Mas'ud or Ibn Ka'b and others. For example, there was a man, Qari Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Ayyub al-Baghdadi, who was more popularly known as Ibn Shanbud. So he would recite ahruf that were, uh, that were known by solitary reports, which were not accommodated by the Uthmani codices. Okay, so he was lashed a few times and he was released. The second type was someone like Qari Abu Bakr ibn Miqsam, who stuck to the rasam of the Uthmani Mus'haf, and, and he knew the canonical readings, but he believed that it was permissible to vowel and dot the rasam however he wanted, as long as the Arabic was correct, 
and without even the slightest consideration for Isnad. So he repented of this. Okay. Um, so the, the point here is that authorized readings okay, were investigated from the very beginning. Right? Um, so this, the claim of the the claim of the Orientalists that you know any the, the Qari had free range. He had an unvowelled text, undotted text, so he can just make up readings at will. It doesn't make sense according to the evidence because someone like Ibn Shanbud or Ibn Miksam was actually prosecuted for doing that. Right? That you were not allowed to use your ijtihad when, when voweling and dotting the text. You had to stick to handed down tradition. There has to be a senad. You cannot bypass oral tradition. Okay. Um, yeah. So just to finish up here, I want to provide further evidence that the claim of the Orientalists is simply wrong. So let me restate the claim of the Orientalists. Here's the claim, right? The big claim. The Qurra in these regional areas were absolutely free to vowel and dot the text however they wanted without restriction. Okay? As long as the context, meaning, and grammar was sound, and that this is why different reading traditions came into existence. So let me, let me show you why this is false. So Asim al-Kisa'i, Yaqub Khalaf, read al-Fatiha as Maliki yawm right? The other six said Maliki yawm like Nafir. So it's a 60-40 split. So here the Orientalist says, you see, the Rasam allows for both. So some Qurra chose Malik, and some Qurra chose Malik. They were free to make that choice. And yes, this is true. They were free to make this choice. But here's the problem. In Surah 3, verse 26, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِي الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ All ten Qurra said مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ It's unanimous. Why? Why didn't the six Qurra who read مَلِكِ يَوْمَدِينَ in Al-Fatiha recite this as مَلِكُ الْمُلْكِ Right? It makes total sense according to the meaning. It's contextually valid and it's in correct Arabic. Why didn't anyone choose this reading? So it seems to me that they did not have that choice. They were not authorized to read this word in this verse as Malik. Right? They did not have this recitational latitude in this verse. Why? What makes sense? It makes perfect sense that the regional Qurra were constrained by the living oral transmission of the Quran, the handed down, the handed down recitational tradition of the Quran. They were constrained by the Sunnah of Qira'a. Another example, right? Have you ever heard anyone say Malik in Nas? Why not? If you were free to say Malik or Malik like we do in Fatiha, why didn't anyone do it here? Why? It's, it's never happened. There's no recitational latitude in this verse. Why? Because readers were constrained by the Sunnah of Qira'a. Okay? Here's another example here on the slide. The underlined, this is um, chapter 6, verse 83. What's underlined is Narfa'u darajati man nasha. Right? Narfa'u darajati man nasha. Okay? So again, the Uthmani codices were dotless, no dots. Yet all ten Qurra read these two verbs as first person common. Narfa'u darajati man nasha. Here's the question though if variant readings of the Uthmani textual tradition originated with the regional Qurra, were voweling and dotting these regional codices at will according to their ijtihad, why didn't anyone read this as yarfa'u darajati mayyasha with the verbs in the third person? This makes total sense according to the context of the verse, yet no one read it like this. Why? Because they were not authorized to do that. They were constrained by the sunnah of qira'a. So here's the point. If reciters were free to dot and vowel the rasum, of the Uthmani codices as they deemed appropriate, then there would have been tens of thousands of variant readings throughout the Quran. Tens of thousands, and there really isn't. In reality, reciters were extremely limited as to how to dot and vowel the rasam, because they were constrained by the sunnah of khira'a. And this is the most convincing explanation. But here's another question, and this is probably the last slide. The last slide, yes. Almost. Second to last slide. 
Um, how many variants exist in the canonical Uthmani reading traditions? In other words, how many total words in the Quran are affected by the ahruf? And by words, I mean nouns, verbs, and particles. So not counting dialectical variations, because those don't change the meanings. The answer is not very many, just a fraction. According to Ibn Mujahid, it's about 700 words, which is less than 1% of the Quran. A Western scholar, Van Putin, he says that number is too low. He puts it at 2,000, which is 2.5% of the Quran, which is still very minimal. If reciters were free to dot and vowel the rusum of the Uthmani codices, however they wanted, according to context, there would have been tens of thousands of words affected. Tens of thousands. But we have about 700. This means that they were, they were very much constricted as to what they were allowed to read. What makes sense as to what was constricting them is that handed down tradition, a sunnah of qira'a. So I'll just give you one more example. I think this, this is a good one. This will drive the point home. Right? This is from the, a da'i in the UK used this example. It strongly demonstrates our contention that qira'a is sunnah. So the first verse of Yasin, right? The first verse is Yasin. So look at the word Yasin, right? See how it looks in Arabic? Now, like the ya with the two dots underneath connected to the letter seen. Now remove the dots. Okay? Imagine the, what's known as the heikal al kalima, just the rasam without the dots. The consonantal word devoid of dots. This is what the Uthmani codices look like. Yet everyone, without exception, recited this as yasin. They could have recited it as what? Noon seen. Tasin, Thasin, Basin, Nunshin, Tashin, Thashin, Bashin, and Yashin. Yet all recited Yasin. They had nine other choices. Yet all Qurra and the Rawis said Yasin. Why? What are the chances of that? If they were free to vowel it, what are the chances of that? They were constrained by the Sunnah of Qurra. The last slide, and then we're done, inshallah. Okay, just wanted to mention this really quickly. So Yuti mentions in the Itqan, what he learned from Imam al-Jazari, that there are you know, several grades of authenticity with respect to reported Quranic recitations. So I wanted to keep this simple. So broadly speaking, there are four main grades of recitation. So if any particular reading fails to meet even one of those three conditions mentioned earlier, strong chain, agreement with one Uthmani codex in sound Arabic, then it's not considered an authorized reading and it cannot be recited in prayer. So let me, so let me look at the first, let's look at the first example here. Mutawatir means mass transmitted, okay? So Suyuti says most readings are of this type. By consensus, by consensus, these are the 10 canonical reading traditions as transmitted by their two main rawis. So for Nafi, for example, it's Qalun and Warsh. For Asim, it's Shu'ba and Hafs. Okay? These are reported by groups and groups of Muslim reciters with strong and verified chains of transmission that go back to the Prophet ﷺ. Then you have Ahad readings. These are readings that have strong chains, but too few reciters. So they don't have sufficient number of authorities. For example, in the Mustadrak, um, Imam al-Hakim said that on the authority of Ibn Abbas, the Prophet ﷺ would recite Surah 9, verse 128, as لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رُسُولٌ مِنْ أَنْفَسِكُمْ أَنْفَسِكُمْ In addition to أَنْفُسِكُمْ Okay, there is coming to you a messenger from the most noble among you. In addition to the standard, there is coming to you a messenger from among yourselves. The Arabic is correct both ways. The meaning is sound both ways, and both agree with the Uthmani Rasam. Now, none of the canonical reading traditions read this as أَنْفَسِكُمْ So you may not recite it in prayer. It, why? It was just not popular. Could this have been revealed to the Prophet as a harf? Of course, it could have been. But since this harf did not gain prevalence, this reading only has the strength of a sound hadith. So it's not strong enough to be an authorized qira'ah of the Qur'an. Because even a sound hadith is not considered absolutely definitive. There is still a chance of error. It's not a dalil qat'i. So for the Qur'an, we cannot take that chance. Do you understand the difference between mutawatir and ahad? Mutawatir means 
that absolutely sound, agreed upon, mass transmitted, can be recited in prayer. Definitely the Quran. Ahad is there's a chance of doubt. It's dhanni. It could have been revealed as Quran, but has too few transmitters. It has the strength of a hadith. Still has a sound chain. Then there's shad. Shad means isolated, unsound, or anomalous. So a shad reading may be in correct Arabic. It, might have a, it may even have a sound meaning. And it might even agree with the Uthmani Codex, but the Isnad is unsound or somehow defective. For example, instead of saying, Iyaka na'budu, someone says, Iyaka yu'badu. So instead of saying, only you we worship, he says, only you are worshipped. They make, he makes the verb into the passive voice and makes it third person. Right? Um, so a reading like this has no transmissional basis. So if, if a reciter were to recite like this, the, the authorities would ask him, where did you learn this? And he says, from so-and-so. The authorities would go to so-and-so and ask him, where did you learn this? And he would say, I, I just heard it somewhere. I vowed it myself. Right? Or my brother used to recite like this. Or I don't know where I heard it from. Right? So authorities were very, very rigorous on, about particular readings uh, about um, uh, what reciters were reciting in public. And then finally, of modu or fabricated. So these are readings that are deemed fabricated by authorities. So these readings have multiple problems. So in addition to an unsound or non-existent isnad, there are other issues, such as uh, you know, disagreement with the Uthmani uh, rasam, grammatical errors, unacceptable meanings. For example, Abu Aswad al-Duali once heard a man recite a verse in the Quran, chapter 9, verse 3, which says, Anna allaha bari'um min al-mushrikina wa rasuluhu and he read it as Rasulihi, which gives it an unacceptable meaning. Right? So when you hear that, if you know Arabic, you think, whoa, there's no way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that. Right? So he asked the man, who taught you your qira'ah? And he said, I, I vowed it myself. I said, You're, you can't recite prayer. You, you, you have to learn how to recite. So mutawata readings are without question Quran and may be recited in prayer. Ahad readings. Um, may have been revealed as Qur'an, they may have been revealed as Ahruf, but they're outside the Uthmani textual tradition. So these are Ahruf that were either abrogated or abandoned. Uh, so they may not be recited in prayer, but have the strength of a hadith. Uh, it is possible, but very unlikely, that Shad readings may also have been revealed as Qur'anic Ahruf, but they were abandoned or abrogated. Uh, these readings really don't have any type of authority, other than perhaps a minor exegetical function. And then Ma'udu'a readings are definitely not Qur'anic and have no authority whatsoever. All right. Well, I think I'll end it here, inshallah. It's a little past one. Uh, no, that was a mouthful. Um, <laughs> hopefully you can go back and watch it back on tape and uh, take some notes or... Um, slow things down and do some, some research and free to ask me questions, inshallah, through email. Yes, sir. Well, he was reciting, so, so <clears throat> Asim would recite in public and Hafs and Shurba would take what they heard from him. Right? And, and, there, and he would recite in different ways because you have that sort of, you, that, that latitude amongst the Ahruf to do that. Um, but generally, the, the two Rawis are very, very similar. Like, there's some differences between Hafs and Shurba, but very rare will there be a difference. But that difference will come from Asim. Why are there only two? It's to, to simplify things, right? These are the two top Rawis, the two top students of the eponymous Qurra. So to simplify things, uh, to sort of make things more manageable, to limit the number of Qurra'a. Although there were other Qurra'a that were, I mean, Imam Tabari documents some 25 Qurra'at during his time. And they were all sound. Right. Yeah, they, they, you'd have to go to like a Muslim bookstore somewhere in the Middle East or order something online. I guess I forgot about the internet. Yeah, you can, they do, they do. And this is what Christians do. Like they go to, they go to a, what's that place called? Hyde Park in England. And they bring like 10 Quran Mus'haf. They bring like a, like a, you know, Ibn Kathir, and they bring like a Warsh, and, um, and they bring like a, a Hafs. They say, look, there's different versions of the Quran. 
And then a lot of Muslims there, they don't even know about the Ahl. They don't even know about Qur'an. Yeah, so, so they're like, no, you, you, you made this. This is the Qur'an you invented. It's like, no, this is, this is the Qur'an. This is a, it's a different version of the Qur'an. You don't even know about this. The Qur'an is different. And, you know, they, so that's how they present it. And the Muslims suddenly, they have this sort of faith crisis. Like, oh, I, you know, I was always taught by you know, the, the, the khatib that, and my dad and my uncle that it, the Qur'an is every, every dot, every letter, every, everything is exactly the same. It's, it's, not, it, it's just not true. Right? Um, so, yeah, they have, they, they have masahib. But like I said, 15 of them, 16 of them are really just not recited anymore. They just kind of fell out of use. Because of Hafsa and Asim, probably because of the Ottoman Empire. I'm guessing maybe they, they, they sort of preferred Hafsa and Asim. So it just sort of blew up all over the world. So the dominant opinion from the ulama is that the, that the, the ordering of the surahs was, was, was by the Prophet That's the dominant opinion, right? From Fatiha to Nas, he ordered it. He ordered everything. Um, there's a minority opinion that the ordering was done by the, the committee of Uthman. And it's basically the longest to shortest, although there's some exceptions to that. Generally, books of antiquity, that's how they were ordered. So if you look at, for example, New Testament, it's basically longest to shortest. The, the Talmud is basically longest to shortest. Um, uh, but Allahu alam, uh, with the companion codices, it's basically, again, longest to shortest, although there are some differences. Like, Ibn Mas'ud and Ubay ibn Ka'ab, yeah, they have Baqara, Ali Imran, Nisa, somewhere in the beginning, not necessarily in the exact order of the Uthmani Codex, but it's basically longest to shortest. Uh, but the dominant opinion is, yeah, the Prophet ﷺ every year would review the Qur'an with Jibreel and that, that, that was not just the actual content of each surah, but the actual order of all of the surahs. That's the dominant opinion. And there's a great book by um, his last name is Mir. It's called Coherence in the Quran by Mir. It's an excellent book. It's very short. It's on the methodology of, um, of uh, Al-Islahi, who was a, a, a great scholar of the Nadam of the Quran, uh, the sort of coherence of the Quran. And he makes a very strong argument that that the order of the surahs in the Uthmani Codex uh, has this miraculous sort of aspect to it. That, that, the, that he has this concept of like a surah pair, that, the, that, the, that surahs that are next to each other, they complement each other in a really interesting way that, he'll exp that he explains in that book. Yeah, probably, yeah. His last name is Mir. I forget his first name, especially with an M. His last name is Coherence in the Quran. It's, it's basically on the... On, so there was a scholar um, named Islahi, who was a South Asian scholar a few generations ago, who, um, who, looks, who specializes in the, the Nadam, which is sort of like the, the structure of the Quranic discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so some some mentioned that that the first sort of printed Quran ever was the Cairo edition of 1924, and they happened to print Hafsa and Asim, right? So that's why it became popular because it was the first printed edition ever. So they're able to mass produce it, and it just sort of um, so that seems to be the answer. I mean, I speculated the, the Ottomans. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but that this seems to, seems to be the more sort of historical response is that the first printed Qurans ever were Hafs and Asim. Yeah. In the Shia, they, they also recite Hafs and Asim. You know, so it's totally agreed upon. Some of the Shia don't believe in the, in the Ahruf, right? But they'll say that Hafs and Asim is accurate because Sayyidina Ali is in the chain. So any of those, any of those ten qiraat is, is correct. Any of them. Well, they can't they can't change it because the text is uh, the text is stabilized. It's known by tradition.
yeah, it's not, it's not going to work. It's just impossible to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 they can't change... They can't change the actual rasam of the Quran. It's just it's, it's, it's impossible. But they, they could mess with the meanings of it. But even there, our belief is that the meanings are preserved as well. So there's always going to be, you know, a, um, a jama'ah. And that's why we're Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, right? Yadullahi ala jama'ah. Right? The, the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the majority. You know, so don't. Don't go after these fringe elements because every every heretical group in Islamic history used the same Quran to justify their position. The Mutazila, the Jabariya, the Qadariya, the Shia, all of the groups, they use the Quran. They take certain verses out of context in the Quran. That's how they abuse the Quran. Yeah. Yeah, but, but changing the text is just not gonna happen. It's impossible. Yeah, mashallah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. I know you're sitting on the floor for a good three hours. I don't think I can feel my legs. <laughs> yeah, please let me know if you think of questions or things. You email me, inshallah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's the. This, this one is. um. This one was a bit technical because we're, we're establishing, you know, textual credibility and things like that. But the, the next one is we're actually going to look at the content of the Quran. How is the Quran uh, inimitable? Like, how is it? How is it impossible to imitate? Like, what does that even mean when we say that? When the Quran says that, what does that mean? How do we as, as substantiate that claim? Right. So we as, as substantiate the claim the Quran has been preserved. But how do we substantiate the Quran as being? A literary masterpiece, and then and then certain um, um, stories mentioned in the Quran. Like, what is the Quran doing to the Bible, the biblical stories? Is it, is it confirming? Is it correcting? Is it doing both? You know, and how is it doing it? And what does it have to do with actual like secular history, as far as um, as far as uh, what what secular historians are saying about these stories of the past? How does the Quran? engage with those stories, like intertextuality, is a very important concept. The language of the Qur'an, asbab al nuzul like why were certain verses revealed in the Qur'an. So actually looking at the text, now that, now that we've established the text, what does it actually say? Yeah. So that's, that's a just as important, if not more important, seminar.